Good morning. This is the September 26th meeting of the Board of Directors of the Golden Rain Foundation of Walnut Creek. This meeting is being recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, you can sit in one of the back three rows. It will be posted on the internet. Also, we're still in our trial of the new residence forum uh, uh, trial period here where we have multiple residence forums. The first residence forum is for people who want to speak on something not on the agenda multiple items on the agenda or just don't want to wait around. Uh, if you want to speak at a particular item on the agenda, make sure you note that or choose the appropriate colored form. And uh, if anyone needs to fill out a form, now's the time to do it. Roll call, please. Kelso. Here. Birdsall. Here. Coonan. Here. Nath. Here. Adams. Here. Anderson. Here. Brown. Here. Harrington. Here. Stumfell? Here. O'Keefe? Here. Thank you. Approval of the minutes. So now we have uh, two sets of minutes that you're looking at. Uh, we'll take the first one uh, from the last meeting. Are there any corrections or changes? This is the uh, August meeting. Seeing none, they're approved as written. And the budget meeting, any changes, questions? Nope. Seeing none, they're approved as written. Treasurer's report. Good morning, everyone. I was waiting for Kevin to speak, but I guess he's not here today. Um, so uh, today's treasurer's report is like all the others. First, I'll summarize the GRF August financial results for both the operating budget and the GRF trust estate, and I'll also provide year-to-date data. For the month of August, the GRF, GRF operating budget had a $23,000 surplus to budget. Total revenues were over budget, by $26,000, and total expenses were over budget by $3,000. The month's revenue and expense variances are detailed in item five of today's board package. Cumulative for the first eight months of this year, the operating budget has a $50,000 surplus. Revenues are under budget by $113,000, and expenses are below budget by $163,000. Moving to the trust estate fund, there were 39 membership transfer mm -hmm. fees collected in August, generating $390,000. That compares to 32 fees collected in August of 2018. And the 39 is slightly below the five-year average, which is 41 fees collected for the month of August. Cumulative for the first eight months of this year, GRF has collected 310 fees, that is 18 fewer fees than collected for the same period last year, and $86,000 less revenue into the stress, <clears throat> trust estate fund this year. The uh, Finance Committee is forecasting the total MTF revenue by the end of this year at 4,200,000. So we have four more months to collect $1,334,000. Total trust fund expenditures in August were $285,000. The two major expenses were $101,000 for machinery and equipment and $180,000 for debt service on the GRF loans. The month-end cash balance in the fund is $3,741,000. Any questions from the board? Thank you, Mary. CEO report, Tim. Good morning, board members, residents, and staff. Um, the first item in my report today has to do with uh, Comcast. Uh, however, I'm going to defer that till later in the, on the agenda uh, because of the complexity of it. I won't go through it again you know, now and then again uh, on the agenda item. So we'll hold that. We'll hold off on that. But what I did want to talk about, I have a couple other items, but there's an important item that is not in your information. Um, that just occurred uh, th just this week. So there was a fire again at the power pole on Akalani School property near entry 16 on, on Golden Rain Road. The fire was extinguished quickly. Uh, it looks like preliminarily, we haven't gotten a report from the fire department yet, but um, the initial assessment was that it was a squirrel that got electrocuted, ignited, fell to the ground, and then ignited the brush underneath. Now you'll remember last month that uh, PG&E, after a lot of arm twisting, finally agreed to do a one-time clearance 
right under, directly underneath this particular power pole. Now this pole has been the site residents have claimed of five fires now in the last dozen years. Uh, that's two we know for certain um, that we've documented in the last 14 months at this exact same location. So yesterday morning, uh, I think this fire occurred on, I think Tuesday, it was either Monday night or Tuesday night, late in the afternoon. Um, yesterday morning, I spoke with Vic Baker. He is in charge of PG&E's operations in the East Bay. Uh, he was up in Auburn managing the power shutoff um, that they had started, I guess, a, a day or two ago up in the Auburn and Foothill area. So the bottom line is this. Um, PG&E had agreed last month to replace that pole, to, design, to do whatever they have to do to, to redesign it and install a new pole by the end of this year. They had told our community when they came here last September that they would replace that pole. This was about um, six weeks or so after the last fire. They said they would replace it by the end of last year, and obviously that did not happen. Um, we can't be certain that the pole is the problem, but probably it is. The fire marshal, everybody, you know, the report from last year was that it was another animal that got electrocuted and it ignited the brush. The school district, who owns the property underneath the pole, I've been in touch with the superintendent a number of times, and uh, Rebecca Pollen, our landscape manager, has been in touch with their facility director, and um, they are in compliance with the fire district's regulations and brush clearance. They are not willing to do any more than the minimum required under the regulations. Um, PG&E was not obligated to clear the brush under that line. They did that voluntarily at our significant insistence. And not just us, not just Golden Rain Foundation, but a lot of residents had put pressure on them as well. But my conversation with Vic Baker yesterday was concerning in that they do not see this as, as a high risk. Our residents, however, do. Their homes are right below this location where this fire occurred. Um, and uh, you know, to have two fires in exactly the same location in 14 months indicates there's something wrong with the design. And what, the, what is happening, we believe, is that a squirrel jumps from one line to the adjacent line. The tail is probably still touching the line they're leaping from and the front feet are landing on the other line and they're closing the circuit getting electrocuted. Same thing happens with birds. The, the fire on Skycrest last year, a week after this other fire on this particular power pole, um, which was above mutual four, uh, that was caused by a bird. Same thing, the wing span is, is spanning and touching both lines at the same time and then they, it causes a, a short and they get electrocuted. So um, what has to happen is a couple of things. The pole itself, if you were to look at it up close, it's pockmarked with thousands and thousands of woodpecker holes that have acorns inserted into them. So the structural integrity of the pole is probably at risk. Then you have the problem of the, of the physical lines being too close to each other. So I, I'm not, we've done all we can do with PG&E. Um, they are not going to accelerate this any faster. They, as I said, last year they committed to replacing the pole by the end of uh, 2018. They did not. They have committed to replacing the pole by the end of 2019. They have not yet. Uh, we're not at the end of the year. But I think it's time now for the community to exert pressure on the California Public Utilities Commission. So tomorrow I'm going to draft a letter to the uh, the CPUC on behalf of Golden Rain and advise them of this problem and advise them of all the instances and times that we've been in communication with PG&E about this. And, uh, and what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to encourage residents to do the same thing. Um, some residents last year, um, I think, complained to PG&E, and I don't recall the exact details. I think it was about the same poll, but it might have been for another reason. I just can't recall. But in my subsequent meetings with PG&E, which we meet with them every three or four months, uh, they indicated to me when we met, and I was unaware at that time that residents had filed a complaint with the CPUC. 
So PG&E told me that some of our residents had filed a petition or something to the CPUC. That got PG&E's attention. They weren't particularly pleased about it, but when the CPUC starts putting pressure on them, they do act. So I think it's time. I think um, what I'd like to do is have the newspaper um, print this information. Uh, there is a complaint um, receptacle on the CPUC website, and uh, there's two ways to communicate with them. One is via email, but I'd rather not do it via email. I think it, it too easily can get dismissed or overlooked when it's via email. So I'm gonna provide the address for the CPUC for residents to, to file a complaint. You would address it to the CPUC Utilities Safety Branch. The address is 505 Van Ness Avenue. That's in San Francisco. The zip is 94102-3298. The website says that a complaint should include your name, uh, the name the account is billed under, which I think in this case would be NA, because it's we're not talking, it's not even a, it's not an account of ours. This is on Akalani School District property. But it does require your mailing address, the service address, which would be, I would indicate that it's Akalani School property um, near entry 16 on Golden Rain Road in Walnut Creek. The name of the utility, which is PG&E. The name of the utility or company's representative you've contacted, and that name is Vic Baker, V-I-C-B-A-K-E-R, and then a brief description of the problem. So um, I would like to encourage the community now to step up. I, I, we have no other recourse. A, a resident wrote me yesterday and uh, asked me for, they wanted to know who owned the property, they wanted to know a whole lot of details, who we were dealing with at the school district, who we were dealing with at PG&E. They wanted to know what legal actions we're taking. Now here's the, the, the issue, this is not a legal issue. We have not suffered a loss, no mutual has suffered a loss as a result of these fires. So we don't have a legal claim, it's not on our property, so we have little authority over the, in fact we have no authority over the school district and we have no authority over the CPUC. The school district is maintaining the vegetation in accordance with the fire department's regulations. The fire department has confirmed that. The CPUC, um, pg and &E operates under the CPUC guidelines. They are in compliance. We just have a faulty pole. It's the design, whatever it is, it's attractive for the wildlife for whatever reason. It is the highest pole before, as, as the, power comes up in the poles up this hillside, it's the highest pole before the power then drives underground coming into Rossmore, serving that part of Rossmore. So that, that's how they described it to me. So it's the last pole before the power goes underground and comes into Rossmore. As you know, we don't have any power poles in Rossmore. They're all underground. So this particular pole is bringing the power into that part of, of the Rossmore community. So for whatever reason, it's attractive to the wildlife, but it needs to be redesigned because it's, we've got to minimize this risk. So I think the only way to do that at this point is to put pressure on the CPUC. So I'm looking at the newspaper. I um, hope that you can put something in the paper and I can provide you more details with this uh, if you'd like after the meeting. So um, the other items in my report for today uh, on a completely different subject there was an item that we did not discuss at the budget meeting uh, two weeks ago. Um, it was a re relatively minor item, nobody thought to bring it up, um, but it occurred to us after the meeting, oh, we forgot to tell you about this. So there had been a request by the dog owners that use the dog park near the fitness center to have porta potties. It's been a long standing request. Um, we looked into it, we've gotten a quote on it. It's relatively minor. I, I believe it's around, it's less than $2,500 a year. Um, so we did build that into the budget, into the maintenance budget. Um, so that's, it's embedded in, into the budget. It's such a minor amount, it didn't warrant um, a, a calling it out as a special item, but I wanted to disclose that to you because we neglected to the other day. If the budget is approved for 2020, the porta potties will be installed in January. So I just wanted to highlight that for you. Um, of course, when we get to the budget item, if that's something that you feel strongly about one way or the other, that can be removed from the budget. So it is built into the budget already. If you don't want it there, it can be removed. 
the other item I wanted to share with you is Clubhouse Organic Recycling. So um, I think everybody's aware now, for the last several months, Republic Services, which is our waste hauler, and Recycle Smart, which is the city and this region's, um, uh, we'll call it the waste franchiser. So this, our city, Walnut Creek, Lafayette, I think, uh, I think maybe San Ramon, Arinda, Moraga, they all collaborate and created this entity called Recycle Smart. And that's who negotiates on behalf of these cities with Republic or the waste hauling uh, entities. So the organic recycling started in the mutuals in the spring. And it's, uh, I think, had some success, um, but there's been some problems. Um, the frequent comment that I hear, I'm sure you have heard, um, it has nothing to do with Golden Rain Foundation, but we hear it because a lot of residents get confused around who has the responsibility for this. Um, well, when you put organic waste in containers, and it heats up a little bit, which it's going to do if the temperatures get above about 50. Um, part of the organic process is the breaking down of these organic materials, and that attracts bugs and maggots and critters and raccoons and so on. And that's what people, and ants, that's what people get kind of worked up about. So uh, Republic is doing all they can to mitigate that. Some of the mutuals have, are contracting with a service to come and clean the cans uh, on a regular basis. I'm not sure what the frequency is. It's relatively inexpensive to have it done, but it is an additional cost. Now, m most of the mutuals are saving money that have implemented the organic recycling uh, because uh, there's no, I, I believe there's no charge for the organic can and there's a charge for the waste can. So if you can reduce the size of your waste can, you can reduce the cost and then you get the free uh, organic and uh, blue recycling cans. So a lot of the mutuals have done that. What uh, we, I met with, organ with uh, Republic and Recycle Smart a, um, a week or two ago, and what they shared with us is they're a little overwhelmed by the success of this. So they've actually put the brakes on adding additional cans in the mutuals. Uh, because they are having trouble managing where they're at right now. They need to get their systems and the logistics all worked out, so it's a little rough around the edges. Concurrently with the Mutuals initiative, Golden Rain has been in discussions with them, or with Republic and Recycle Smart, about how we can do composting in our clubhouse facilities. So um, we've agreed uh, to roll that out it's going to come over the next several months. Republic's not quite ready for it yet. We're not ready for it yet. Our caterers are not ready for it yet. But we're going to begin an, an initiative to uh, educate our caterers, uh, educate our custodial staff, uh, provide a composting bin in the in the various clubhouses, so the catering staff, at a minimum, will will compost appropriately. And then there's an education process with all the various caterers who work here in Rossmore. So that's coming. I just wanted to let people know about it. We, we get a lot of comments about that to the board and to me. Um, I wanted people to know that this is something that, an initiative that we're working on. The last item is employee transitions. So in August, we had three employees begin employment with Golden Rain. James Freeman, a range worker on the golf course. Uh, Bridget Marco, an, an accountant with the uh, accounting department and Seth Schoberg, a new lifeguard. We had five employees leave employment with Golden Rain in August. Michelle Arvizu, a fitness center, um, a fitness trainer. Uh, Kaya Brown, an event center uh, assistant, uh, an event assistant at the clubhouse. Um, Michelle Dyson, and a fitness front desk attendant at the fitness center. Ryan Kittinger, a range worker on the golf course and Linda McCampbell, our longtime senior accountant, retired. And that's my report. Oh, Thank I'm sorry, you. I got one more thing. One employee, Armando Medina, transferred from landscape technician on the landscape department to a custodial technician in the custodial services department. And that's it. Thank you, Tim. I'd like to suggest that we also put that information on the television and on the website since the paper is not coming out until next uh, Wednesday. So now the residence forum. I think we have one person, Barbara. We have one person this morning. Please um, give your name and address. You have three minutes to speak. If you have any written material, 
give it to Deborah when you're done. So our first person. Oh, I thought it was someone different. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the name is Tank Aegis. I hope I have that right. Forty Tarmigan Drive, number one, Walnut Creek. I want to talk about inclusiveness. Here is a definition of the word inclusive. Aiming to provide equal access to opportunities and resources for people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized, such as those having physical or mental disabilities or belonging to other minority groups. Before the GRF board added the word inclusive to its statement of values, are you telling me that Rossmore was not inclusive? As a white, heterosexual, Republican, Roman Catholic minority, was I not inclusive before? Now that's a shocking thought, shocking thought to ponder. I am personally insulted that after a handful of people talked to the board at your last meeting in this hall, that you rushed to make the amendment that same day. As I understand it, this whole thing started because one woman was excluded from a Rossmore club based on ethnic origin. I also understand your attorneys advise you that that club in question had its right to do so. I believe that this board should focus on more important matters, such as upgrading the bathrooms at Hillside, without which many Ross Morians are greatly inconvenienced. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, the uh, resident member committee reports, Dale Aquatics. Bob, you weren't supposed to know this, that I'm not Brian Stack. President knows all. <laughs> oh. In fact, you're going to talk about turning pools into pickleball courts, if I'm correct, right? <laughs> you're not supposed to know that either. Anyway, I, uh, I am secretary uh, of the Aquatics Advisory Committee, and I'm here uh, because Brian couldn't. Uh, the minutes that uh, were submitted are as is. They're accurate. And the reason I know that, again, because I'm secretary. The other uh, thing that Brian wanted me to uh, share to the board is that we do support the plastering of Dollar Pool in November. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Questions? I have a question. When is this uh, bi-monthly meeting schedule going to go into effect? Deborah. January 2020. Okay, thank you. I guess no questions. Okay, now we have the audit committee. Looks like Chris is going to give that. Good morning. Um, I'm representing the audit committee, and the audit committee met on September the 9th and unanimously passed a motion to recommend the hiring of a new external auditor. The firm is Shea, Labaugh, and Dalberstein at a co cost of $99,000 for the 2019 audits and tax returns. The committee worked with Rick Shacoff to solicit proposals from four firms who were interviewed in an earlier meeting. That was a marathon four-hour drive that we interviewed the four firms th during. Two finalists were selected and requested to provide three-year cost proposals. Based upon this information, we are recommending that um, they be hired as our um, new auditors. This is unanimous from the, from the committee. I'm going to turn the floor over to Rick Chakoff, who um, will give you more information. So th there really isn't much to add. You know, we went out, we do this periodically, um, basically just to get a, a new set of eyes. Um, we actually solicited six proposals, uh, received four. As Chris said, two were finalists. One of them was our, our uh, auditors right now, BPM. The other one was Shea Labaugh Dauberstein, and the, the committee elected to recommend Shea Labaugh Dauberstein. The request is that um, you approve the proposal and allow me to sign the engagement letter. You want a motion? Okay, so we need a motion. 
Mary. I'm going to make this a detailed motion so that we uh, capture everything in detail. So I move that the board accept the audit proposal from Shea Labaugh Doverstein to perform the following audit work. One, examine the GRF financial statements. Two, examine the employee's pension and 401k plans. Three, prepare the necessary income tax returns for GRF for the year ending December 31st, 2019. The base fee will be $99,000 and the CFO is authorized to execute the engagement letter. Second? Is there a second? Second. Okay, Dale seconded. Any discussion or questions about this? Carl. It's, how does these, the cost of this compare to our previous audit? It, it's about $5,000 less. Actually, BPM, when they uh, put their proposal in, they lowered their own fee. But um, it's about $5,000 less net than, than we paid before. And you're going to see that there's a recommendation on the budget to lower professional fees as a result of this. Other questions? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? OK, thank you. Anything else? Nope, I guess not. So the uh, Finance Committee report, Bill. Thank you. Uh, the regular meeting of the GRF Finance Committee was held last Tuesday. We reviewed our recommendation of prior months that the trust estate fund maintain a target minimum fund balance of $2 million by the end of 2019. The committee continues to make that recommendation. Given that level of fund balance, our projections show that a remaining balance of $965,000 is available for trust fund projects for the remainder of 2019. The committee recommends the approval of the 2020 GRF operations budget, which was presented at the September 10th joint meeting, subject to the following modifications. One, a decrease in the GRF audit expense of $5,000 to reflect a reduction in audited uh, professional services expense. We just mentioned that. Number two, add revenue of $1,440 to aquatics for a swim, uh, swim lesson program. Number three, add an additional income of $8,000 to golf operations due to proposed guest fee increases. And four, add additional revenue of $51,480 to vehicle maintenance in anticipation of funds from the bus grant program. We also specifically reviewed the budgetary request for $250,000 for slurry, slurry sealing and recommend that that amount be approved as originally presented. Uh, that's my report. Any questions for Bill? Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Oh, Carl, never mind. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, have you looked at the fact that due to the Creek Project postponement, what is the impact of the delay in maybe doing it this spring instead? And will it allow us to advance some projects that we would do in 2020? And has the finance looked at what this specific amount that we could spend in 2019 that we would have spent in 2020? Yes. Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, we assumed, given that we wouldn't be able to do the project, the, the uh, Creek project in 2000, it wouldn't be done in, or wouldn't be available uh, to be done in 2019, that the um, amount that we had originally suggested or was, was suggested that we project for 2019 of about a million dollars was then um, moved to, we assumed, to, two, two, to uh, 2020. That number may not be that amount. We're looking at various options there. But it will be in the 2020 budget that we will be presenting later. What that does, Carl, is it does increase, if you will, the um, un, uh, unallocated at this point money from the uh, original budget uh, to about $965,000. Uh, if that m amount is spent during the remaining part of 2019, we will still have, hopefully, a, a, based on our projections, uh, a $2 million bu uh, balance carried forward for next year. 
So it does, yes, uh, free up, if you will, uh, from that, uh, that obligation. Any, Any other, other questions, questions for Bill? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Board committee reports, planning, Carl. Yes, the commanding, uh, planning committee has started working on simplifying our priority uh, formulas so that we don't have as many categories. And hopefully in our next meeting, we will finalize these categories to make it simpler for the board to do project prioritizations. Any questions for Carl about planning committee? Thank you. Policy committee, Ken? The meeting was canceled, so we have no report. Okay, but we do have uh, the second reading of the uh, online privacy policy. Uh, so we were going to uh, vote on that today. So are there any questions or comments about that, Carl? Yes, I am still deeply disturbed that uh, Rossmore employees give th out personal information to third parties who in their disclosure say that they do sell some of this uh, information. And I think as long as we don't have this entirely under Rossmore control, I don't really feel comfortable with this policy. Okay, any other comments or? Can I have a motion uh, to approve the uh, new online privacy policy? I so move. Second. Okay, any other discussion of that? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? One opposed. Any abstentions? Nope. Okay, thank you. New business, now we're going to work on the budget. And the way we're gonna handle the budget is that I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the budget uh, as presented. We're not going to vote on that. Then we're going to consider, well, actually before we, we get to that point, uh, I wanted to find out if there were any comments or questions or things that are not on the agenda, concerns about the budget that people have that we should address now. Okay, seeing none. So when you want the budget, uh, uh, I'll, I'll explain. On it we talk, right? right, so then we're gonna get a, a motion and a second, but we're not gonna vote on that until we consider these following amendments that are listed in the agenda here. And then we'll have one final vote that will uh, vote on the amended motion. So can I hear a motion to approve the operations budget? Mary? Okay, can I move that we consider I move that we approve the proposed 2019 GRF operations budget in the aggregate amount of $23,615,638 and a coupon amount of $294.78 per manor per month, including cable TV and internet service. Second. Okay, we have a second. Uh, it's a 2020 budget, isn't it? Yes. Well, it's. it's it's listed in the agenda incorrectly, so. Good catch. Okay, so now we have some uh, modifications to that proposed budget. Uh, the first being uh, the increased revenues for the uh, swim lessons. So could I hear a proposed amendment to the budget to amend the budget to include the swim lessons, Carl? I move that we uh, amend the budget to include the swim lessons. Okay, a second? second. Sue seconded. Discussion on that? Okay, all in favor of that amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, now we're going to the trust facility property maintenance projects and purchase of tangible property, including Slurry Seal, a proposal of $250,000 for Trice, Tice Creek, uh, for Rossmore Parkway. So Can I? So Sue made a motion and Dale seconded. Now discussion on Slurry Seal for Rossmore Parkway. 
Mary? I, uh, most of you were at the Finance Committee meeting when we discussed this, but I want residents to know that uh, it was talked about and alternatives for the slurry seal were considered. Um, and then the Finance Committee voted uh, to approve the $250,000. So the first thing and point that was made was the increase in this, uh, the road maintenance. In 2017, it was $60,000. In 2018, it was 50000 In 2019, it was 170000 And in 2020, it's in the budget for $325,000. So the first question was, why this almost 48% increase? And um, it's largely due to a 40% increase in materials for paving. We saw uh, a couple months ago we had to approve extra funds to pave the RV lot. There's a lot of paving going on in the state of California as a result of the uh, 12 cent uh, per gallon tax on gasoline. So perhaps uh, we won't continue to see this large increase, but 40% is a lot of money. Uh, for us then in Rossmore to spend maintaining roads. And it, uh, we do have a person who looks at our roads, tells us what we need to do, and actually uh, they're gonna develop a grading system for us. So perhaps rather than spend all this money in the future, uh, we'll want to live with something less than the wonderful roads we have now. So in terms of alternatives that the Finance Committee considered, for a slurry ceiling Rossmore Parkway. One idea was let's not do it at all, but that only delays uh, the work. It'll still need to be done eventually. Uh, another idea was to divide the project into two. The upper part of Rossmore Parkway uh, is in the worst shape. That would be $148,000. The lower part would be $108,000 in 20 21, so the total cost uh, is about $6,000 more. So the Finance Committee didn't think the uh, phasing in would be a good idea. And then the third thing we considered was to use some of the reserve that we have in the uh, Trust Estate Fund for maintenance. However, that reserve is really targeted for 2023 when we know we're going to have a large increase in maintenance on trust uh, property. So again, that was rejected. So I wanted to make sure that the residents know that uh, this was discussed, alternatives were looked at, and the Finance Committee uh, recommended uh, moving forward and spending the $250,000. Thank you for the thorough report. Other questions about this? Carl? Yes, I would like to find out from our expert, whom I see standing there, is the reason why it needs to be slurried. Because I understand that slurrying, you know, it's not so much a matter of keeping our roads beautiful, but an overall reduction in cost because preventative maintenance can uh, save us a lot of money in the long run if we do it right. But what disturbs me is, and I don't understand, is Rossmore from what a parkway in this area was paved at different points in time. So why are these all needing resurfacing at the same time? So for the thousands watching at home on TV, this is Martin Lemmings, our public works engineer. Good morning, everyone. Um, roads do not deteriorate all at the same rate. It's, you have guidelines of when you can expect things, but there's the reality, and for our 15 miles of roads, not everything falls apart at the same time. It just happens that right now, it was done at around the same time. That stretch of Ros Rossmore Parkway now shows all the signs that it's at the point where if you do not go for preventive maintenance, it's gonna start falling apart quicker. And 
this is the point where I go out and look and see those signs and then make the determination that if we do this maintenance, we're on track to maintain this segment of road. And by doing slurry sealing, let's say you get 20 years out of a section of road and we go on a cycle of slurry sealing, we can get 40 to 50 years out of it. What I see, again, is, is the deterioration of that entire stretch is at that level right now. Why something deteriorates a little faster than other sections, I can't tell you. Kathleen? So um, I have a question about, uh, or we, we were talking in the meeting about the slurry seal being a preventative. So my question is, uh, if we do the slurry seal now, um, it will extend it. And if we did another slurry seal in another 10 years or whatever, was uh, okay, you, you're saying we could get 40 years out of it. Now, um, I live uh, on Ptarmigan, and when that was dug up and completely resurfaced, um, I heard a lot of people who live on Ptarmigan uh, in my district that the road really looked pretty good. So um, we were all surprised that it was the expense of completely ripping up the road and rebuilding it, um, you know, was done. So um, if we, in fact, decide not to have quite as pristine uh, uh, roads, um, how does that fit into, uh, you know, future um, uh, resurfacing uh, or slurry sealing and, you know, completely rebuilding the road. And was a ptarmigan <coughs> slurry sealed in the past? Can you give me a little history of ptarmigan? Ptarmigan was slurry sealed, and I am hope I got the year right. It must have been 2006. It's, yeah, that long ago. At that point, it was pretty clear that that section of road could get one layer of slurry seal, and it already started to show signs that that was at the end of its useful life, the pavement itself. Surprisingly, the slurry seal's appearance held up really well. So that kind of uh, hides the fact that the road underneath showed that it was uh, in, in need of replacement. If you had left that section longer, we would have started getting issues with the base underneath. And then you're going to start seeing the alligatoring. And now you would not only have to replace the asphalt pavement, you, only have to work, you also have to work on the base underneath. So that was done to avoid additional costs pretty uh, soon. So how old was the, uh, the Ptarmigan uh, Road? And, and if it had been slurry sealed earlier than, you, what, you said 2005? I think 2006. Six, okay. If it had been slurry sealed sooner than that, could it have lasted longer? So first of all, when was it originally? I, I do not have the information of when it was uh, done, but I, since I couldn't find anything, that was, an, I think, an original uh, segment of road. So that road is 40, 30 years old? 40. 40 years old? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Barbara? Uh, a fact that I found interesting in my consideration of this is that the upper Golden Rain is Rossmore Parkway. They both go off. Yeah. Um, it is subject to horizontal uh, pressures on the road, There's and movement. that may yeah. make it deteriorate more. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, there's some horizontal movement that's causing some of the, the cracks. That, that pattern is uh, indicative of that. Other questions? Carl. Yes, I looked at that ptarmigan stretch, and I found it sort of interesting. Drive over it dry, you don't see anything. Drive it over a rain, and you start to see these crackings that you know is, you know, periodic cracks in the road. And if you look at it closely, there were a few spots that looked like they were would shortly develop into potholes. So um, driving, as I say, driving it dry looked great. 
when you looked at the rain, because of the sheen of the water on it, you could definitely see cracks appearing. Mary? Martin, it might be uh, interesting for residents to hear a little bit about road uh, grading. I don't mean with equipment, A, B, C, D, and some of your plans about our roads. Well, you had mentioned that there's, in the state of California, this, this ranking, and you have these lists of where cities are. And I am looking at a pavement management system just to make it easier for me to document everything, but having this rating could be an interesting thing for residents and for the board to see where, uh, where we are with our roads. How do we stack up with cities and, and where are our areas in the valley that might need attention sooner than later? I just think it's a good thing to have for all of us to know where we're at overall, because right now, frankly, it's in my head. and it should be available really for everyone to see at a glance. Other comments or questions? Les. I uh, want to let you know that I appreciate what you've been doing with the streets at Rossmore. They are in great shape and I, I, I'm happy that you're keeping an eye on that. Thank you, sir. Tim. So, Martin, uh, at the Finance Committee meeting earlier this week and then today, um, everybody has a copy of this document, which um, describes kind of the life cycle of roads and when work can be done. Could you go into some detail as to um, why slurry sealing is important, its cost in <coughs> relation to a surface replacement, um, when it should be done and when it doesn't, when it makes sense not to do slurry sealing because of, you know, the roads deteriorated too much and we don't want to throw good money after bad. Can you talk a little bit about this and that philosophy? All right. So if there's a new section of road and it's approximately eight to ten years where you don't have to do anything, the road still looks good, it's going to fall apart at a very slow rate, but after that they found roads start to deteriorate much faster. So even if you don't see anything, the sun, the UV rays are beating down on the asphalt binder. Oxygen in the air, uh, the oxidation, and you can see that we get a new road, it's all nice and black, but then oxidation takes place and they turn into a light gray. So in those years, it's at a very slow rate, but then it will go faster. If asphalt binder, is not doing its job anymore of holding the aggregate and the sand together. Uh, it cannot expand and contract when the temperatures go up and down. You have a good chance that cracks are gonna start to form. It's not gonna be able to support traffic. Um, what I've noticed over the years is garbage trucks have gotten so much bigger and so much heavier and they do damage to our roads. You, you, you can see that, especially the entryways. So after that time period, and again, some, it's something I have to go out and look at because eight to 10 years, well, it could be 12 years. You just have to go out and look, see if the signs are there. But at that point, if you do preventive maintenance, so at a much lower cost, you put a protective layer over the pavement. So now the sun has something else to beat on. The air, the oxidation takes place in that slurry seal. And the integrity of the asphalt layer underneath will stay in place. Well, it's gonna fall apart slowly over time, but you're really slowing it down. On top of that, you get a smoother ride, and it looks much better. So if you follow a schedule, and they say five to seven years, it looks like we can do it less than that. So let's say seven to 10 years, you just do a slurry seal. Maybe the next time you do a slurry seal with some minor patch repairs, you can do that several times and just double the life of the pavement that you put in. So it's, it's pretty important to do it that way and spend way less money than just letting a segment of road run its course and then replacing it. Thank you. Ken. <clears throat> the, the lower half is in much better shape than the upper half, 
My question is, if we slurry both halves, both uh, upper and lower, is this going to put the lower half on an equal footing in terms of future repair and rehabilitation with the upper half that's right now, aside from horizontal shifting? Uh, it should be. The horizontal shifting, however, will require in the future that we're doing localized repairs there. But in terms of how the slurry seal will protect that pavement and how it will hold up, that should be about the same. Yeah. Other questions? Kathleen? So I just want to be clear. So by slurry sealing the upper and the lower section, then um, the having to repave it wouldn't be any sooner for the upper section that's already cracking because of the motion? I'm not sure I understand. Not a full repaving, but we will have to do some localized asphalt repairs because there are some segments where you really notice that shift and others are just holding up okay. So where we really have that movement, we would have to go in and just do some minor repairs. Other, Dale. Is um, Upper Golden Rain Road, the portion that, where they're shifting, is that the only place in Rossmore that's affected by roadways that are affected by shifting? Uh, we have one interesting spot on Stanley Dollar <laughs> Drive around entry five. And, and from what I've seen is a lot of engineering firms have looked at it, nobody has and been able to determine the reason for it. Um, and in the end, it's not a very expensive thing to every now and then maintain, but that's the only uh, area on the main roads that, uh, that we're aware of. Other questions or comments? Um, I want to say when I first saw this, uh, since I bicycle up the upper part regularly, I thought, well, this is not needed. I mean, we patched the crack seal and that'll be fine, but after reading your handouts and listening to you speak, I think I'm glad that we have an expert on staff. It's something we take for granted here that we have the roads that we drive on. We don't pay much attention to them, but we spend three quarters of a million dollars a year on keeping them going, so it's something we do have to pay a lot of attention to, and, and uh, I want to thank you. That was very clear. Uh, it certainly helped me. Uh, it changed my mind uh, that, like everything else, I, I usually prefer to listen to the experts. Not always, but in this case, I think it makes sense. So anyway, if there are no other questions, uh, let's have a vote on approving this uh, or keeping the $250,000 in the proposed budget. So uh, it was so moved, so it was not <laughs> clearly. Well, that's true, actually. Well, we have a motion, but you're right. Since it's already in the budget, maybe we don't, should we? Right, so maybe the person who made that motion could withdraw the motion. Okay, good point. I'm glad you caught that. Thank you. Okay, so that one is withdrawn, and we don't have to vote on that. Um, okay, next one is the $5,000 decrease in audit fees uh, because of the uh, change in audit firms. Can I hear a motion to approve that? Reduction. Okay. A second? second? Sue seconds. Any discussion about that? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion to increase golf revenue due to proposed increase in guest fees of $8,000. Can I hear a motion about that? So moved. Second? Somebody? I second. Kathleen second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Consider a motion to increase the bus grant revenue. This is to put in, uh, based on past uh, history, that uh, we hope we will get that, and, and uh, the, the odds are that we will. So can I hear a motion to uh, change the budget by $51,400? Second? Second. Okay. Discussion of that? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, consider a motion to add funding for the emergency operations plan. Tim, why don't you, or Rick, why don't you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, this, for starters, it's, it's listed on your agenda. It's 15400 Upon further review, it's 15000 even. 
And what that is is for the implementation of the emergency operations plan with things like training staff and putting the plan in place, um, there would be an operating expense for 2020. So this is a follow-up to the uh, Lopez plan, and so once that gets approved and, and accepted, we'll have to then implement it, correct, Tim? So Dennis Bell, as you know, has been working with Lopez and Associates on the update to the emergency operations plan. He has the draft of the plan. He's going to be present. Lopez and the city of Walnut Creek will be presenting, and Dennis, the plan to you at the special mid-month meeting next month. Um, uh, Dennis's assessment of uh, the implementation cost to implement what they're recommending in the plan is that we need to spend about $15,000 in the next year's budget to operationalize the plan. So even though you don't have the plan in front of you yet, he already has an estimate of what that cost is going to be. So that's, and that came after the budget hearing. So we didn't have that number until after you met a couple weeks ago with the budget. So this is an add-on to the budget. Oops. Any questions about that? What is the amount? $15,000. So can I hear a motion to add that to the operations budget? Uh, I move that we add $15,000 to the 2020 operations budget to fund the emergency operation plan. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, any other f discussion? Rick. So I have a last minute item, but it's actually good news. So. I'm up here giving it to you. Um, we got a, a we had estimated 13% increase in healthcare costs for the employee plan with Kaiser. The last minute, it turns out, is going to be 7%, which would provide a $44,000 expense savings in the budget. So we're recommending that you uh, vote on that. Great, good news. Okay, a motion, Mary. I move that we modify the proposed 2020 budget and reduce the estimate for Kaiser benefits from 13, 13% to 7%, thus saving $44,000. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion or questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So now we have a resident who wants to make a comment on the budget. Oh, no, we just voted on that. No, re resident forum. So we have a resident, and then uh, Rick, you'll add this up and give us a total to vote on, correct? Okay. Where does the Porter Potty come in? It's already in there. It was already in the budget. It just wasn't called out. All right, so we have a resident. Yes, uh, Marie Kahn would like to speak to the to the op operating budget. Yes, good morning. Um, I live at uh, 1571 Tarmigan Drive, and I um, uh, follow water use issues very closely, and I'm a member of the East Bay Mud uh, 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 Water Conservation uh, Water Landscape Water Conservation Committee, uh, which meets regularly. And I wanted to thank you with great enthusiasm for a tiny little budget item that comes at, at the end of the, uh, the budget. But you had voted last week to keep the conversion of the median, the, uh, the landscaping and irrigation in the median strips uh, on our roadways. Uh, you had voted to keep that uh, allocation in the budget, and I'm very grateful uh, that you did that. I wanted to add uh, one, one more uh, reason for you to be proud of doing that, <laughs> in addition to the reasons, uh, the economic savings, which will be dramatic after the initial expenditure. You will save, of course, on maintenance, that's cutting, mowing, uh, edging, uh, um, putting chemicals on, and uh, all of that, but in addition on the water expenditures, all of which will be dramatically less uh, in um, low water use landscaping and low water use irrigation systems. But there's one more thing that I'm not sure everybody is aware of, and that's that 
East Bay mud water regulations um, prohibit the use of, um, uh, prohibit irrigating with potable water on uh, median strips on public roadways in the East Bay Mud uh, Service District. Of course, the city of Walnut Creek, all of the cities in the county, throughout the state, people uh, or agencies conform to those regulations. And we've never had to because we're private property. Even during the drought, we didn't, we didn't uh, convert as every other median strip has been converted on public roadways. But uh, GRF, uh, general, uh, the GRF general plan includes a commitment to conforming to uh, East Bay Mud and the City of Walnut Creek regulations. And by making our median strip water use conform to those regulations, we will be conforming uh, to the general plan uh, proposal. And for that, I thank you very, very much. I hope you will vote on it, vote to keep it in the budget. Thank you. Okay, now we're ready for the new total, Rick, for the budget for next year. Okay, um, let me make it larger so I can read it. Okay, let me just, just run through everything. The original proposal, or original resolution, I'm sorry, was a budget of 23 million 615, 638. There's a coupon of 294, 78. Uh, the amendments are addition to uh, revenue, I should say, of 1440 for swim lessons, uh, reduction expense of $5,000 in professional services for reduction in audit fees, 8000 more in golf revenue, uh, 51400 more in uh, bus grant revenue, an increase in expense of $15,000 for the emergency operations plan implementation, and a reduction in healthcare expense of $44,000 that nets out to $23,520,798 with a coupon amount of $293.60. Thank you. So we actually have a uh, reduction of a dollar a month. That's always good to see. Mary, well, no, we already have a motion. Oh, we have a motion and we've amended it. So now we're going to vote on the amended motion with all of these. So. Are uh, there any other last minute comments? Carl. Yes, on the porta potties for the dog park, <clears throat> I can understand that we do not want people bringing their pets. Obviously, you can't leave your pet unattended, but bringing pets into the fitness center, I think, doesn't make any sense. I can see the point of this. However, when we discuss the hillside thing of putting porta Porta potties. The subject was brought up: is does a, putting a porta potty in essentially lead to a commitment that we will eventually put in permanent bathrooms? So this is a concern I have. Anybody have any comments about that? Jeff, you seem to be the leading expert on <laughs> toilets and porta potties. I can put that on my resume. I, I, I don't think this would lead to a, a expectation or a commitment in the future. You're talking about a, more or less a park site, uh, and it, it's adding a porta potty feature. It's pretty different than the hillside situation. Okay, thank you. So with that, I think we're ready to vote. All in favor of the amended budget, say aye. 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 Opposed. Great. Thank you. Now we're going to get a creek restoration update. Paul? OK, talking about the creek, I think everybody knows that we have some washout sections at uh, the Buckeye Grove and the Pickleball Court area. Our, our construction window for creek work is June through October. So what that means is we can only work within the creek during those months. Um, we had hoped to try to get some of that work done this year. We completed our design work in June. We sent it off for approval to four different government agencies. They move very slowly. 
We were able to get a meeting with the government agencies uh, in July, all four of them. Uh, one agency arrived late. Three out of the four, those that were on time, were okay with the design that, that we had proposed. The fourth agency, the uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board, um, wasn't in favor of the design. Um, they were partially in favor, but they wanted to see a little more natural work <laughs> and a little less uh, Gavian wall. So we had to go back and do a redesign. Because of that, we will not make our, our construction window deadline. So that's, that's the bad news. We'll have to wait until June of 2020 to start that work. We're still pushing forward to get permits. Our, our goal is to have permits and contracts in hand by the end of this year so that we can get contractors lined up and scheduled to begin right away in June. We did uh, go out for preliminary bids already. Um, we have one bid back. We're still waiting on another, and the bid came back well under budget, so that is good news. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $300,000. We're hoping the second bid comes within that range, and we'll see, we'll see how that ends up. But it looks like it's not going to be as expensive as we had anticipated, which we had about a million dollars in the budget. We just have to hope we don't have more washouts. Well, if we, if we get into a situation <laughs> where it washes out, I think we have uh, a real case to go back to those agencies and say, look, <coughs> we, we're ready to go and you're holding us back and we can hopefully get an emergency repair approved. Any questions for Paul? Dale and then Les. Uh, Paul, for that type of work, um, would we anticipate increases from the contractors like mm -hmm. that happens with a lot of other types of contracts? I mean, with any construction job that could happen, on the, on the last uh, creek repair that we did just inside the gate, we did not, we did not experience any change orders. Good, thank you. So more to answer your question, the, the bid that came in, we did send back to our consultants to review to make sure that they haven't missed anything because we, we do not want any surprises. Les? The, uh, the bids that you have was We have one on bid, only one bid right now. The bid that you have, yeah. is that based on your original design? No. Is that based on yeah. a new design? Yeah, the, the changes that, okay. that were requested were very subtle. It wasn't a complete redesign. It was essentially on, on one side of the creek, lower the Gavian wall and add more natural soil and, and willow abatement and that type of stuff. So it wasn't, it wasn't like a major redesign. Other questions for Paul? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, appropriately on the uh, agenda now is the review of the capital projects list. As we heard earlier, there is now available $965,000 for potential projects that we could start in 2019. Remember that uh, we will be doing our capital list uh, coming up in just a couple months for 2020, but <clears throat> it seems to me uh, in I personally would like to see us uh, discuss the, uh, the bathroom, but we have a whole list of projects, so I'd like to hear what people have to say. That is the bathroom at Hillside. Carl. Yes, under the bathroom project, I, I really think that it should be considered as two projects, the full project and a single bathroom uh, option. My concern is I think in the next several years, we're talking about a major redo, if not a teardown rebuild of Hillside. Um, it seems to me while we want to accommodate people in need, uh, we also don't want to spend money that we will essentially have spent for naught since we're, we may most likely not be able to reclaim any of the monies we are being that we are spending now. So, are you going to make a multi-million dollar donation to our trust fund? Because I don't see that there's any chance in the next few years we're going to do a major remodel of anything, let alone hillside. Well, presumably we will start planning uh, close to when the end of the of the uh, Creekside loan starts coming due. Um, 
So that's seven years, right? So we're talking about at least 10 years out, I think. But Dale? I want us to proceed with the upgrade for the four restrooms and not reduce it down to two. Now, I didn't mean to sort of, hi I did hijack the discussion, but I didn't mean to. So let's approach this from, again, um, we have a list here of, of projects that we <clears throat> evaluated before that we deferred. So let's take a look at those and see what, on, what else is on there that we might want to discuss and elevate. So, so Mary and then Sue. Um, I just want to uh, discuss a correction I think that needs to be made to attachment 10C6. It's the list of projects. The last column on the right, estimated project cost for the Gateway Studios, it says 800,000. I recall the total cost for that project is 1.6 million. At one point we said we'd split it between two years, but I think what's in that column is the total cost. So it wouldn't be a good thing to make a decision about that without the right amount of money uh, listed. Tim? No, what, what this was was the uh, cost associated with these projects that we would expect to incur in 2020. So for example, the water reclamation is gonna be a 10 to $15 million project. We don't identify that, we just identified the portion that would be applicable to 2020 because that project's gonna be in stages. What I think in the narrative, um, dis um, there was a description, which I haven't looked at because I wasn't prepared for this question, but. Um, Yeah, so that, that was the amount we were expecting to incur in 2020 for that project. The studio project we initially had planned over a two year, spanning a, a two year uh, period, uh, but the total cost, as Mary pointed out, was 1.6 was the estimate. We don't have actual bids on that yet, but that was the, the estimate. I, I guess then if this column represents the 2020 cost, it's very important for the board to know if there's more cost with any of these projects because in 2021, uh, we have all this uncertainty about John Muir. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to approve something just looking at what 2020 costs are if there's more in 2021. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. We need to make sure that if we're not phasing the project that we are effectively committing than the total amount over a two-year period, though. So I think unless we decide specifically to phase it, which this proposal is not, then that's a good point. We have to understand that we shouldn't then next year decide we're not going to continue on with that. Right. So, okay, uh, Sue, did you have a comment? Yeah, um, yeah I, really, um, I really think we just about have to do the bathrooms, you know, we're not ADA or whatever, even though we haven't started doing anything on it. But I think I'd like to know whether or not uh, once we, could we put it into different, or do we have to once we start on that building? Because I know there's asbestos, I know there's a lot of things involved and I'm looking at Jeff. Uh, I, uh, you know, if, if we do one part, one of it, won't we be subject to the entire building? Jeff is up there. Tim, and then Jeff. Yeah, I just, I, I pulled up the description. So in your packet, you had the information that it clearly indicated that it was 1.6 million. It describes that if GRF, in bold, if GRF approves the project design and scope, it's estimated to cost 1.6 million over three years, estimated 800,000 for the next 18 months. So that was the narrative that was in your packet. Okay, Jeff, about the bathroom. Yeah. So for the restroom project, uh, once you begin that, we have not undertaken a, a formal design. Uh, we haven't had meetings with the city in regards to uh, their input. Uh, it is, the estimate there is based on some preliminary investigation by an architect and evaluation of uh, the current code requirements. So that's what we believe it would, would cost. The next step would be to work on a more formal design and then start to involve the city on would they require any additional uh, upgrades. Uh, since you're bringing restrooms up to code, uh, that, that is a um, Americans with Disabilities Act requirement. The likelihood that they would 
require us to do additional stuff up there is pretty slim, uh, but we won't know that until we get further into it. Well, you're up there. How much have we already spent on the studio project? I believe our contract with PSM Architects was for around 85000 uh, and we've spent that. The project has been submitted for plan review. Uh, we do have comments back. Our next step would be to finalize and put that project out to bid. Thank you. Okay, Dale, and then Les, and Kathleen. My number one um, vote a preference was the creek restoration, and number two was the uh, hillside restrooms. Now that the creek restoration is put off, I think that we need to proceed uh, as quickly as possible with the hillside work. Les? To try to be clear, uh, I thought we were working on the 2019 yes. budget, not the 2020 budget. So we're looking at projects to be funded by in the 2019 budget. Right, but if we approved, for some reason, the studio, we would have to understand that we're effectively committing another 800,000 in the 2020 budget. Right. That was the point he of that. He said three years. Well, two to three years. Yeah. Kathleen? Don't negate that. Uh, so could you explain, where do you go? Could you explain a little bit about um, what would be done in each of the successive years for the studio uh, restoration? And, and the reason I'm asking is um, if we started it, what portion would be done if we didn't continue it the next year or the year after? So it's, it's a little difficult to plan a project based on a, a calendar year. Uh, right now where we would be at is we would put that project out to bid. Uh, once you get con contracts done and you get your building permit, we probably wouldn't be under construction now until, if you went from now and said go and we, we started moving quickly, uh, we probably wouldn't be under construction until 2020 anyway. Uh, the length of construction for that project is probably six to eight months, just rough estimate. So you would probably be looking at spending about 1.6 million between now and the end of 2020. Did I see another hand on this side, Mary? So I'm looking at the uh, most recent long range plan. I don't know if it's in our packet. And in this plan, uh, this is where the Finance Committee determined that there's $965,000 in 2019 that could be spent because we're deferring the creek till 2020. But when we get to 2020, and assuming we spend a million dollars fixing the creek, that would leave $617,000. Uh, so uh, uh, the, total, the total that we have to spend over the next two years is, we have to keep that in mind. Is, that, that, is that correct? I thought, I thought Rick put a million over into next year to encumber that. Rick, could you clarify that? He did, and that's what I'm assuming. We spend a million. Here. I have the, the, the document in front of me. So if you put the million into 2020, um, it leaves funds in excess of target of about a million five eighty two. And then you still, you know, so it's a total of about two and a half million dollars. At the end of I, next year. For, so, yeah, for, for the, so for, for the 19 and 20, if we keep the 2 million targeted balance and we spend a million on the creek, we will have 2.5 million roughly to spend on other projects. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, I thought so. Okay. So, other, Carl and then Sue. So, I guess the situation on the bathroom thing is we can decide that we want to proceed with it in terms of looking into how much it will actually cost and further design, uh, which would be eventually approved at a later date. And the other thing that's high on the list is the solar for common areas, gateway data site location, and backup generator, which are sort of tied together. And in light of the PG&E, uh, 
uh, potential blackouts, I think these projects need further investigation. Well, we're certainly uh, early, too early, I think, to discuss the solar since we haven't even addressed the options as far as purchase, lease, or power purchase agreement. So it seems to me it would be premature to really vote on that now. But uh, so looking at our list of prioritizations that we did before, water reclamation is up there. And I think the estimate was the first round of that was 420,000 and over two years, 728,000 uh, for the two initial years of the three-year study. Uh, the solar common for the common areas, which we just talked about, uh, the irrigation watering technology project. Now that is, if I recall, the, um, uh, the combination, the, the, all of the medians. Um, we've approved the web portal, uh, the studios, and then the bathrooms at, uh, at Dollar, um, gateway data site relocation. I think we, uh, there was some question about that that we, we don't know if we have made a final decision on whether that's needed or not. So are there discussions of any other projects on here that we should be having uh, before we ask for a motion for something? Tim and then Kathleen. I just wanted to, there's a note in your packet. There's a note in your packet uh, in this item that the water reclamation figures, so subsequent to this document that we used for the, when we did the prioritization in July, uh, we, we've gotten new estimates, cost estimates on water reclamation. So for 2020, the estimate would be 400 and just a, under 496,000. So it would not be the 728 that's here, just in your deliberation. Okay, so I guess other, Kathleen. Uh, well, I think maybe we should discuss for just a minute the um, uh, irrigation watering technology since we have that way up at the top of the list. And, um, and the idea of that was that, first of all, it is um, required for public spaces, though I understand we're private so we don't have to comply, but we would be saving money. So um, this is a good, uh, I think, expenditure for future savings. Okay, uh, Carl. Yes, I kind of agree with you. For one thing, it is spending trust money, which comes out of coupon, uh, which comes out of uh, transfer fee, and it will save us money in coupon. And it sort of bothered me, bothers me that this year the, our coupon raise is higher than it, percentage-wise than it has been in the past. And I think we ought to be mindful of coupon costs. So I kind of agree we ought to look at projects that could potentially lower the coupon. Or not lower the coupon, but in we don't have to increase it as much. Sue. Well, I, you know, I, I think the water reclamation need to be really considered, but I, what I don't understand is why are we still talking a million dollars for the creek when we just heard from Paul Donner that he has a 300. I'd really like to, uh, yeah, I, I'd like to know. Thank you, Paul. That's for construction only. We're still going to have consulting fees, permit fees, other things on top of that. And remember, we also are into this project already. You know, I, I can't remember the exact amount. So. I, 300,000 is not a safe figure to use. I think we need to get both our bids back. And I, talking with Clayton, I think we're probably going to be in the 600 to 800 range. Okay, thanks. And I would like to, someone mentioned it earlier, but I want to reiterate the fact that we have a big unknown with the medical center, that uh, the estimates from uh, our real estate agents there is that if... Uh, John Muir does leave, and we have to get a new tenant that we could spend three or four million dollars in bringing that up to, to code. I together that don't. If you you have a million five ninety two for the two years, not two million five ninety two. Right. Oh, okay. So, good. Well, I'm glad we cleared that 617, up. Six hundred and seventeen thousand. Plus this, plus the uh, nine sixty five. <laughs> good to keep the CFO on his toes, Mary. Thank you. <laughs> we 
help each other. Okay, so, um, so I think we do need to be cognizant of the fact that we might, it's possible we could get a loan for that, but we still may need to put that much money into the, uh, the medical center. So, Carl. Yes, I would like to move that we move ahead with the hillside bathroom design and study because I, I sense that there's a lot of board interest in it. And uh, I second it. Okay, any further discussion on that? That the estimated cost is $250,000, but as I think we're talking about the. Um, $230,000, right? Uh, but that's an estimate, so we realize that we have to, we will get an estimate back. Mary? Yeah, I, w I want to say something about the, the uh, bathroom. And, um, I, you know, we set these priorities not knowing about the bathroom. We set, and then, the, then this project came up, and we were all shocked that there was not an ADA-compliant bathroom in Hillside. We have a vision about inclusiveness, and thank you for the definition. It talks about including those who are uh, disabled. So I think we have to do it based on our vision. And I, um, it was difficult for me to look over all these projects, but once I realized that we are serious about inclusiveness, I, I think it should be done. I agree. Any other comments, discussion? Ken? Yeah, I like Carl's original idea of maybe just doing one bathroom. Uh, I have this reserve. I hate to invest a lot of money in that hillside clubhouse if we're going to do something about it in maybe five years or five to ten years out. Uh, I just really hate to spend two and a quarter of a million dollars that might be replaced uh, in five year, five or six years. Well, as we talked earlier, the loan's not paid off until seven years, and then you have a whole public process. So we're talking a minimum of 10 years, I think. Les? Yeah, I was just going to respond to that. I've been on the board six years, and renovating Hillside has been a topic every year. Well, it hasn't occurred yet. So the proposal is for the full bathrooms that's on the floor. Kathleen? So the, uh, talking about the hill, hillside renovation, I mean, they just did a lot of work on it, right? So they put in new floor, you know, spruced it all up. I mean, um, you know, if I've been, I've been up there and it looks nice. So um, I certainly can't see that we would be discussing ripping down the whole building uh, in, you know, in less than 10 years at the very minimum. Dale. I know water reclamation is a long ways off. But before we start putting extra money into Hillside, like re reconstructing it, the whole place, I would prefer that we use whatever money we have to move towards the water reclamation. Because in the long run, we are going to benefit tremendously if we succeed in having that. So we have a motion on the floor to begin the process of renovation of the bathrooms for ADA compliance at Hillside. Is there any more discussion about that particular project before we vote? Yes, we had a second. All in favor, oh, Carl. Yes, uh, I do think that should include, as, as Ken and I said, an option for the board to do either one or two bathrooms. I think we need to decide now. Uh, Kathleen? Uh, I remember bringing this issue up last time this was discussed, and they were saying that if you only do one, which was, you know, my thought, that it would cost a whole lot more to do the other one later. And so it was much more beneficial to do it all at one time. Mary? I think the other uh, issue is quite often when you're at an event, um, you take a break and everybody needs to ba have a bathroom and I, I don't know if one's enough. So, uh, you know. <laughs> Carl? Yes, the other thing is there are a lot, our buildings are really not ADA compliant. And a lot of people have made accommodations such as narrower wheelchairs, et cetera. And those people 
even though they may be in wheelchairs or using walkers or whatnot, are still able to use non-ADA compliant. And that's why I think it's probably gone 50 years or so without this issue coming up. However, having uh, at least one bathroom, I think is very important. I'm not sure, and it would depend upon what I see in the eventual project and looking into the details, whether I would be in favor of one or two. So before we discuss this more, Jeff, could you address this? What are your thoughts on the uh, feasibility of getting by with one bathroom up there, ADA compliant? Well, my recommendation would be to do both uh, restrooms. Your, your exterior ones are also used primarily for the lawn bowling. Uh, the clubhouse there does not have a restroom <laughs> either. Uh, so your <clears throat> capacity for the complex, you probably should tackle both. It's not clear also when you look at the entire complex and the count of the number of facilities you need, if we would be required to do both anyway by the, the city just to have uh, the required number of fixtures. Uh, so I don't have that answer, but I would suspect that would be the case. So I guess, is there more comment to? Are we voting on, as the, as the motion says, two bathrooms, right? Correct. OK. I guess at this point, uh, well, the question would be whether it's worth the time and money to have the architect uh, or planning process go down the path of both and then we'll make a decision later or do we make the decision now that's what we're faced with Dale we're not talking about two bathrooms we're talking about two sets of bathrooms men and women so we're talking about four bathrooms that are already there and just converting those so I want to make sure that there isn't any misunderstanding about the numbers Tim I'm just looking at my notes that I took when Carl made the motion. So in my notes, Carl said that you moved to begin the hillside bathroom and Mary seconded. Right. Now, the number that was on the sheet was 230,000. And then subsequent to that, you sa suggested that we should just do one bathroom. So we should be very clear as to what we're actually authorizing and, and be clear with Carl, who is the maker of the motion, as, what, as to what his intent was. Carl? I guess my intent was that we look that we proceed with the project and we could make a decision later on depending upon what we see in the project because if we're stu uh, studying, if we're actually doing the designs, I would presume that we move ahead with the project of doing something and the something will depend upon the numbers and designs that we see that are developed in the project. I don't think you can do that, though, because it's, they're two different projects that we're going to ask the architect to move forward with in the city. So we, I think we should make the decision today if we're going for the full project or not. Putting it down the road just seems to me confuses the issue. So uh, I, what I'd suggest is that we vote on the motion for doing the full project. The people who don't want to do that, who want to do a partial project, can vote no. And then if that motion fails, then we will proceed with that. That's my proposed way of handling this. Sue? Can, can you read us the, uh, the I take it we are, have a motion to start the, uh, the information uh, to do all for, for. Yes, I have a motion made by Carl, seconded by Mary, to move ahead with the hillside bathroom design as the full project. Thank you. Okay, so all in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Opposed. One op opposed. Motion passes. So we're moving forward with that project. Thank you for bringing in that to our attention. I was shocked, as everyone else was, that we didn't have that already, and I'm glad we could do that sooner rather than later. So do we want to address any other potential capital projects for 2019 at this point? Bob. Sue. I'd like to recommend that we start looking at the water reclamation. 
Um, I don't know how we frame it, how it should start, but I think we need to start investigating somehow, and I don't know how to do the motion um, to start that happening. Well, I think the first phase of that project was going to be $420,000. Uh, so, Tim, are, is the consultant at this point ready to actually move forward, or are we still waiting on more information? So just let me clarify that the first phase that, was, uh, that we put in the packet was 496000 Yes, yeah, so Bo Jeff has been in touch with the consultant, and he can articulate that. So I've been uh, talking with uh, Jim Brezak uh, quite frequently. Uh, how the next phase would evolve is, is still uh, in question. I think we would need to develop his proposal and bring that back to you for consideration, and that would then lay out the uh, next phase and subsequent phases. I'm not sure we're ready to come to you right today and say it's going to cost this much to accomplish the next phase. Okay, thank you. Les? I'm, I'm with Sue. I just want to make sure that we don't forget the water reclamation project, that we should keep it going. And when we find out what's the next cost, then we can talk about that. But let's not forget it. Kathleen? Could you summarize for us uh, the phases that have been done so far, so sort of where we are now? So what we've accomplished so far is a, a preliminary feasibility study uh, that was presented to you last, I believe earlier this year. Uh, since then, we have uh, submitted and um, received our water rights for riparian for the creek and that has subsequently adjusted the quantity of water that we need to replace with a uh, recycled facility. Uh, that then would impact the overall cost of a, in size of a project that we would undertake. The next phase really is determining how we will go about uh, securing the facility, and there are several options. It could be uh, one where GRF completely undertakes the design, the, all of the environmental work and uh, construction, and then eventual operation and ownership. There's an option where you can, uh, similar to the solar property or the solar project, where it's more of a third party that uh, owns and operates, and GRF is paying for water from that uh, company. So that has to be determined as really part of the next phase because that will determine how much of an investment you need to make in, in the next phase. Okay, any other? Ken. Point of information, what, what do you need from the board now in the budget to keep this process, water reclamation, proceeding on schedule? It's hard to say right now. Um, I, I think what we would need to come back to you with some options so you would have uh, the ability to look at what the next phase may include. I, I don't really have a number for you or a proposal to present to you at this point. Uh, I would have to come back with options for you to consider. Les and Carl. But, you know, we're only talking about three months in 2019, and I suspect you're not going to have an expenditure for water reclamation in 2019. So I just wanted to say, let's not forget it. It's going to come back in 2020, uh, I hope, but it, I don't think it's part of the 2019 expenditures. I do have one, one concept, though. Uh, we have on our list since we've already approved to do the bathrooms at Hillside. The other part that we have is to renovate Vista Las Trampas rooms in Hillside for $100,000. I would like us to think about doing that as part of the construction for the bathrooms. So with that project, uh, in one of your earlier steps, you approved uh, replacing the acoustic panels in there. Uh, that was originally going to be part of that proposal. Uh, so we would have to dramatically scale that back. It's also replacing some chairs. So our intent now is to kind of redo that project and bring it back to you when you consider your projects, 
your list of projects next year. Carl? Yes, the other thing is uh, the trash and recycling. I know that there's a problem with green recycling if there's any kind of contamination and certainly there's a lot of misunderstanding about how things are recycled. However, I think we might want to consider green cans in the kitchens, primarily for the catering uh, caterers to use. I think, uh, let's table that. We heard earlier that there's a problem that uh, we're working with the the vendor right now to try to work that out. So I don't think we're ready to make any capital expenditures in that area until that gets worked out. Kathleen? Um, in looking at the list, um, considering that we're talking about this year's budget, which is only a few months um, longer, that the irrigation watering technology is the one thing that I think we could um, start on. We wouldn't have to approve the whole thing we could do um, one section, which is, I think, how they proposed it. That just seems to me that um, it's one of the things that we could possibly get off the ground now for the money we have remaining this year, and it is fourth on our list. Okay, other thoughts about that? Tim? So this is, this is, um, presented in your packet a little bit differently than everything else. The planning committee, and I think this came originally from the staff suggestion, the staff suggestion was that all the medians, the remaining medians be converted over a five year period and that would add up to about $200,000 is the estimate. And the recommendation, if you look in the narrative, describes that this would be done, so you know, one fifth of that would be $40,000 per year, but the full $200,000 dollar amount is the amount shown on the schedule. So you, you could decide to do all of it, and it would cost you $200,000 in today's dollars. You could decide to do the next phase of it, one-fifth of it, and that would cost $40,000. So just a, a consideration. You can choose to do part of it or phase it out over time. Any comments about that? Mary. Uh, just clarification, we are doing, and it's in the budget, right, one median already in 2020. That's right, I think. So if we add, and it's, is it 50, I think? Oh, here, come, yeah. So we could add another one and do two. I just wanted to make sure I remember correctly. <laughs> Paul, okay, we thought I you were going to answer that. <laughs> I think I have a list here. Uh, absolutely, we could do one, two, three, four, or five. It's just a matter of, of going out to bid and, and the, having the funds The available. question though, Mary thinks we, we somehow we approve We did approve one though. Yes, yeah, we well, did. there is one in the budget we had planned on doing, right. um, going in sequ sequential order basically, the next one, the first right. one through the gate, which is actually in the worst condition. Okay, but I do know somebody on this board who wants you to start at the top and work down. Yeah. That's another, yeah. but just a point of clarification, we are doing one. I think what you're suggesting is we do more than one. Now, wh which budget was that approved in? Operating yeah, operating. So it's operating, but this is on the capital budget because it would be all of them together? I I'm confused why we would put it in the operating budget when... Why is it on the capital? Right. Whereas this is capital... Here. I mean, so we could just keep putting it in the operating budget every year and do the five, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it sounds like we're already doing on process to get that done. Thank you. Okay. So Dale and then Sue and then Les. My wishful thinking is that once we do the first median, there's going to be a groundswell here for us to do all of them. Well, I think that's a different world than I live in, but okay, maybe. We'll see. Sue? Well, you know, we, we'd have to change, if we're going to do it all under the capital, we'd have to change where the money's coming from. So why don't we leave it alone, uh, unless you want to go through that. Um, and I'm just going down here, down as we selected them, and... Um, the next one on the list is Rossmore Web Porter Portal. We approved that last time. Okay, so then we're at the Gateway Studios. Right. 
And how much would that be in this year? $800,000. Hmm. Less. You, you, you've all confused me again. <laughs> Irrigation watering technology, are you now saying that that is really the median strips? Yes. Or is it something else? No, it's the medians. Wow. The description was not, in my mind, the best. <laughs> okay. I, I thought you were getting fancy with technology for irrigation. No. Carl? <clears throat> yes, I'm confused as to why the once is in operating and the project is in capital. Uh, I can't answer that. But it okay. is there, and we've approved it, so we're doing one median next year. Okay. So I guess my thought is that we should leave well enough alone, but go ahead. But I, I guess I'm concerned because, you know, we are, we do have, you know, I guess I see it more as a capital expenditure. I don't know why this wasn't discussed before. I guess it kind of slipped my mind to catch it, but it does seem more like a capital improvement than than a, an operating decision. Kathleen? I think as uh, Carl said earlier when it was first mentioned that um, this would be a savings for the coupon for the folks if we did this in the, in the capital budget. And um, so I think that's something that we should really consider because um, I don't know, I, off the top of my head, I can't say how much, but if we did this, then the coupon could go down, what, Couple dollars? No, 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 nowhere near that. I think a it dollar? was maybe six thousand a year in water or something, and maintenance six to ten thousand. Rick? Yeah. Just, just if you want to use a rule of thumb, eighty thousand dollars saves one dollar on the coupon. So one of those medians for fifty thousand dollars is sixty cents or so, something like that. That's the cost, but the savings are still are, are fairly minor. It's over right. long term that we're talking about. So right. it's it's an it, it, everything is significant, but it's relatively insignificant the savings. So it, it went into the operating budget. The medians did because it's it's basically we looked at it as landscaping. We we haven't capitalized landscaping. That, that's why it's there. Mary. So uh, I want to make a comment about the studios. So the total cost one point six million. If we were to approve 800,000 now, and we just approved 230, and for this year we have 965, that, that's more than we have. And then next year, based on the forecast, we have $617,000 for capital. So, so I don't think we can afford to take on the studios till we're sure we have the money. Okay. So I don't want to make this any more complicated, but um, <laughs> something, something that came up actually wasn't my idea, but I thought it was a pretty good idea. Is the problem with the studio is it's a million and a half dollars, effectively all at once or in over two years. You could set aside funds to do the studios at some time in the future and just not spend everything you have. So you could say we're going to encumber two or three hundred thousand dollars a year after a few years have enough to do the, you know, the studios. That's another way to look at it. We have to do it. We can't do them all at once anyway, can we? Because those have to keep working. Don't you have it planned where you can only do one at a time? or? No. So we, we had, uh, during the course of this project, actually talked to you about the option of phasing, doing one wing and then doing the other wing. At that time, the, the board was interested more in doing the whole project as, at once. So what we would do is, is pretty much move everything into some storage containers, uh, go at the project as, as one project. You get some cost savings because you're doing all flooring. You have your flooring sub at once. You have your framing sub. You have your all of the various subs that are going to work on it only come out to the site then one time. The more you phase a project, the more it's going to cost. Uh, it, the reality, if you said go on the studios, by the time we go out to bid and get permits and, and everything else, we're already into 2020 before we start anything. So then you're looking at a start of a project through to completion. You'd be spending about a million six is the estimate in 2020. So it's not on the 2019 budget anyway. So got it. 
Well, if we, if we approved it, we would start the process. I would like to suggest that we defer all other capital expenditures given the uncertainty of the creek cost and the uncertainty of the medical center and wait and see how those shake out before we approve any more capital proposals. So. I agree. Okay. Does that seem okay with everybody? It's great. Okay. No, I was opening it up to see what everyone had to say. All right, now we're going to move to Comcast, everyone's favorite topic. So, Tim, you're going to give us a hopefully somewhat brief summary. Uh -huh. And we'll try. So let's see. So the, we, we've gotten a whole bunch of correspondence from residents, emails and letters. Uh, there's obviously been a number of letters in the newspaper over the last several weeks. So um, the reason for all of this concern is that the Turner Classic Movie Station is being moved from the digital preferred cable package that we currently have to a paid subscription model under the sports entertainment package. Sports Entertainment Package retails for $9.95 per month, and it's an elected option. So the residents of Rossmore can choose to have that or not. Now, obviously, any time you get something that's included and now you have to pay for it, that's what um, causes the concern for people. So uh, as soon as they announced that to us several weeks ago, we immediately uh, contacted Comcast and told them that we were unhappy with that and asked if there was any way that they could provide some, either a concession or an accommodation for Rossmore residents? The answer was no. Uh, this is not something they're picking on Rossmore about. This is a decision that they've made nationally to move the package out, and uh, move TCM out of the digital preferred cable package. The TV package that we have, digital preferred, is the same package that everybody else gets in this region from Comcast different regions of the country, there might be different channels that are added, but in our region of the country, all the channels in Rossmore and outside of Rossmore are the same. The exception is Channel 28. So Channel 28, only we get to see people outside of Rossmore don't have access to that. So the current contract expires, it started in January 2017 and it expires in uh, five years later, so that'll be December of 2021 will be the expiration of the contract. The contract currently provides for 220, uh, they, they call it 220 with a plus sign after it, channels in the cable package and a minimum of 100 megabits per second internet. They don't guarantee either of those. So they don't guarantee, there's no cable operator and there's no streaming service that will guarantee the channels in a given package because the cable and streaming services don't own all the content. They have to negotiate with the owners of the content, and that's exactly why we're at the, in the position we're at right now, which is that the owner of TCM, Turner Classic Movies, is AT&T. AT&T is a competitor of Comcast, but they own that station, and they raised the price so much that there was no longer a way for Comcast to keep it in the digital preferred package. They had to move it out of the package. We've gotten comments from residents, some who have see this as a money-grabbing exercise on Comcast's part, and perhaps that might be part of it, but they have offered it to us at cost, at their cost. So um, they said, we're taking the profit motive out of this, supposedly, and then we're gonna give it to you at cost. So, uh, if we want it. So here's what happens. Every year, at the end of the year, or right prior to the end of the year, by September 1st, Comcast has to notify us as to whether or not they're gonna raise the fee. They are limited in raising the fee. They're capped at 4%. Uh, so it's no more than 4%. And the fee is tied to the starter package, not the digital preferred cable package, but the starter cable package offered outside of Rossmore in Walnut Creek. So if they raise the fee to the starter package by 2%, then they are limited to raising our fee by 2%. If they raise the fee, let's say 6%, they are capped on raising the fee to us at 4%. Right? So that's how the model works. So um, every year they have the right under the terms of the contract to raise the fee up to 4% depending on the starter package rate outside of Rossmore. In 20, at the end of 2017 and the end of 2018, 
they did not raise the fee to us. So for 2018 and 2019, we have exactly the same rate that we had on January 1st of 2017, which is $55. Um, they notified us within the timeline before September 1st that they intend to raise the fee for 2020. What they did not tell us was the amount, and they don't know the amount yet, they say. So, and they probably won't know it until December or January. So, but they did provide written notice in accordance with the terms of the contract that they intend on raising the fee. So we don't know how much it's going to go up. If it went up the maximum, that would be $2.20, that's 4%, okay? So all we know is that they intend on raising the fee and we don't know the, for sure the amount, but if it went up the max, it would be $2.20. In the budget that you approved, we budgeted for that max. Okay, so that's what, what you approved a few minutes ago was the budget for 2020, and that included uh, a new rate of 57.20, where the current rate is $55. Um, and that just anticipates that they could raise it to the maximum. Now, in order to get around this Turner Classic Movie conundrum, they um, provided us with some options. So the first option for you to consider, if you want to, you don't have to, but these, so these are options. The first option is that they increase the rate $2.20, the 4%, and their cost for TCM, which is $2.60, for a total of $4.80 starting January 1. So that would make it $59.80. Um, so that was one way to give it to us at their cost and build in the anticipated increase maximum of 4%. That's one option. The second option is that they increase the rate only $2.20, that's the maximum under the terms of the contract, but they increase it to $2.20 and they include the sports entertainment package starting January 1. In fact, they would start it on October 10th, which is the day that it's scheduled to move over um, from the digital preferred package to the sports entertainment package and they would absorb that loss from October 10th till December 31st, and they would provide, continue providing the channel to our residents uh, for $2.20 total. And there would be no further increase for 2020. So 57.20, but the, the, the kicker, the catch, is that you renew the contract for two more years. That's option number two. The third option is virtually the same, 57.20 as the new number for uh, 2020, um, but you extend for three to five years and they would reduce the cap for future renewals from 4% to 3%. So that's the third option. Now, those are the options that they've given us. Um, the fourth or the other option is that you don't have to elect any of these options. The contract will renew on or the rate will renew on January 1st, likely with an increase, we just don't know what that is. So what you're doing is kind of rolling the dice. Do you want to do that? We've heard from Comcast that approximately 1,000 households watch TCM regularly. That's about 15% or so of the community. We've heard some residents comment when that was put into the newspaper that, that that's outrageous, that you would obligate all residents for $2.20 when only 15% take use of the channel. Another way to look at this, however, is that a thousand people using, or a thousand households, which represents about 1,500 people, um, that that uh, represents a fairly large use of any amenity. We don't have a lot of amenities that get that level of use. So that's another way to look at that, is that a thousand people using any amenity, whether it's a card game or a studio or whatever, that's a pretty big number. Although it is only 15%, 85% of the residents, according to Comcast, do not watch the channel regularly. So if you elect not to, to take advantage of any of these three options, then residents who want TCM would have to buy it at retail at $9.95 per month to get it in the sports entertainment package. The sports entertainment package includes a whole listing of other channels, which I think I, 
I put in here somewhere, but I can't find it quickly. So it included the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, and the, uh, NHL hockey. It included the country music uh, television station, uh, a crime and investigation channel, several other things. So it's a, it's a fairly robust package for those that, and we've heard from people that already buy that and are pleased with it and are pleased because they would, that fee 995 would go away and it would be replaced by the new uh, 5720, the increase of uh, $2.20 over the current rate. So that, I think that's the outline. I know I've, some of you have contacted me and asked questions about it. Um, that's uh, our understanding of the terms that they presented to us and I hope that that was all clear for everybody, so. I have a question, um, did they, I think I recall that they wanted to increase it previously but missed the deadline, is that correct? So, uh, yes and yes. So in, at the end of 2017, uh, about 10 days after the, about a week after the, the due date that they needed to notify us, they sent me a letter saying they intended to raise the rate for 2018. Now there was two problems with that. One is that they missed the deadline, but the other problem was that they didn't provide to me in that letter what the starter rate package was. And so when I communicated that back to them, I said, well, prove to me that you are raising the rate outside of Rossmore in the starter package. And when they looked at it, they didn't like that, but when they looked it up, they confirmed that they were not planning to raise the starter rate outside of Rossmore. So I said, then we're not gonna to agree to an increase. And we would have still probably fought them on this that they, they gave us the notice late anyway. So. So there has been no increase, and they did not raise it for 2019 at the end of 2018. So before we get into the discussion of the actual proposals, I'd like to know if there are any other questions for Tim about the, the facts of the, the case. Tim, Ken and then Carl. Yeah, is, is it true Comcast is offering private accounts or private personal accounts uh, services such as Peacock that they are not offering our bulk package? So that's a good question. So uh, what we have, what Rossmore has, is, is a con a bulk, what's called a bulk contract. And what that means is that they enter in an agreement with a corporate entity, in this case, Golden Rain Foundation, to um, provide their television and or internet services at a significant discount in exchange for not having to generate, in our case, 7,000 invoices every month and manage that, the collection of that and the billing of that and the questions that inevitably come up. What they provide to us is, as I described earlier, the, the TV and the internet, but they also provide um, at the fireside room three days a week, uh, a couple hours a day, um, Comcast personnel to answer questions, sign up people for other services that they might want, troubleshoot their problems that they're having in their receptions of their internet or their TV or whatever. And so they do that, that's part of the service. They only generate, basically, a single invoice to Golden Rain. There's separate invoices for Mutual 61 and 68 because they, in the, in the package, they agreed to some uh, supplemental services. So if a resident wants something like Xfinity Mobile, which they advertise in our newspaper for, the resident first has to establish a retail account with Comcast and purchase some other service. That's how you, that's how they're able to offer, in order to, for the retail arm of Comcast to provide services to the commercial customer, these are two different divisions within Comcast. They first have to establish the retail account and they can only do that by creating a retail relationship before you can take advantage of something like Xfinity Mobile, for example. Now, just yesterday morning, I had uh, earlier this week and maybe last week had approached Comcast and said, hey, this has been a problem for people. I don't hear this problem very often, but we do occasionally. Kathleen received a letter from a resident who just highlighted this, and so I forwarded it off to Comcast and said, you know, why is it that you cannot establish a retail contract for our residents? that why, did, why are you requiring them to purchase a separate retail service before they can take advantage of uh, Xfinity Mobile, for example? So they went back and they talked about it and they sent me a notice yesterday morning that said, all right, we're gonna waive that starting October 1. Um, well, it's not, I don't have it in time for the newspaper for next week, but 
they will put something in the newspaper in the next couple of weeks that will identify that and say that residents who want to take advantage of Xfinity Mobile or any other service that Comcast offers will no longer have to establish a retail account first and buy some other service that they don't want or need before they can take advantage of these other services. So they're going to agree to waive that effective on October 1. So we'll have, they'll have more information in the newspaper about that next couple of weeks. Carl? Yes, I'd like some clarification. If we decide to take one of the uh, contract extension options, say a two or three year extension, um, and they only increase the retail rate of the base thing, say 2%, will we still be obliged to increase our rate the full 4%? Yes. So for 2020, the answer is yes. They're, they're, they're saying if you, they're, they're willing to, to um, give us TCM and the sports entertainment package effectively at $2.20 with no further increase for 2020. Subsequent years, 2021 and beyond, um, if you choose option two, um, you would have still have the f up to the 4% cap. And if you chose option three, you'd have up to the 3% cap for subsequent renewals. But they would still be limited to what they increase the starter package outside. So they still, so if they only increase the starter package by 2%, we would, ex and we extended it, we would only have to increase it say a dollar ten. Right. So so let's go to say the year twenty twenty two and we've extended for a couple extra years, let's say. So if that year the starter package outside Rossmore increased two percent, they are capped. They can't go any higher to us than two percent in that, that year. Would apply. That would apply for for twenty twenty one for our twenty twenty increase as well. Correct. So it's just a pure extension of the of the contract right with the addition of the sports entertainment package if you so choose sue back to the mobile those people who have uh, xfinity mobile will they have to maintain uh the extra you know um or does it get waived after that i, I don't know the answer to that i've asked um ann peterson to contact um and here, here she comes. Anne's, gonna, <laughs> Anne's been in touch with uh, Comcast about this. Yeah, I talked with Brent yesterday. So if you had to purchase a service in order to get Xfinity Mobile, you can dis go ahead and discontinue that on October 1st. So as soon as the new deal kicks in. Kathleen and then Mary. Okay, so uh, uh, you probably can't answer this, but can, do you have any idea of how many people already have the sports package who would then be saving the ten dollar fee? Yeah, they they wouldn't tell me uh, that. Yeah. yeah, Mary. Yeah, I so I want to make sure that I understand the uh, contract expiration date. Our current contract expires two years from now, in December thirty first, twenty twenty one. So we're talking about if we extend two years, going all the way to twenty twenty three, and it's a pretty fast changing industry so the industry is changing quickly unfortunately Rossmore residents don't change quite as quickly well I understand that I, part of us just want to you know uh, live here and have no changes but uh, it could cost us a lot of money okay so Ken now again we're, we're just getting the, the facts we're not discussing the options at this point Ken I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, can we maybe, counter maybe their three <laughs> options with the offer to extend the contract um, two years and get TACM or that or that package, sports and entertainment package, at only the increase that they're entitled to under the present contract? Is that a is that something? Can, can we counter their three options with our own? You can counter, yeah. Um, just keep in mind that the um, TCM goes away on October 10th. So if you want to create, if you decided you wanted to take advantage of one of these options, 
uh, if you counter, there's going to be time, and they will have to work it through their corporate systems. So it's not going to be a timely transition if you wanted to move forward. I will say Tim has been pretty aggressive with their attorney in negotiating this. So uh, it isn't like we just accepted their proposal. He's been on them back and forth. Um, at this point, we're not taking comments from the public. Sorry. Well, that's 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 what we're going to be debating later on. That's that's what we're de that's what we're debating. Going to be debating later on. So, Mary, uh, Bob, I just have a suggestion, and that is when we discuss these options, we could frame it and we could ask ourselves, what's the probability that Comcast is going to raise rates four percent? I sent people articles. Um, about how that business is doing. We can also ask the question, what are the pros and cons of extending the contract till 2023 or longer? And then a third question is really, uh, to the resident's point, does GRF want to be in the business of uh, negotiating TV video content? Um, and if so, how do we do that? And Well, we, we have so. been in that business and I we know. haven't decided to move off yet. But it, that, those are good points. Those are I good perspectives. Think, I right. think we, we have to uh, lift up this conversation. And if we answer those questions, we'll probably be able to decide what we want to do. I agree. Uh, so a couple of facts I wanted to bring out. We, we can't control, I know Tim said this, but I want to emphasize for the people out there because there's misunderstandings that continue. We can't control the channels that are offered. No contract in the United States or probably anywhere in the world allows the recipient or, or the, uh, the person getting the content to control what channels are in there. And that all changes have to agree, be agreed by both parties, us and Comcast, so we can't unilaterally make a decision. Uh, the other interesting bit of information is that we have received, as of yesterday, 68 letters from the public the board has received and it was exactly split 34-34. So just another thanks to Deborah for collating that. So at this point, I think we should begin uh, the discussion on uh, the offers. We, have, we can do nothing. Uh, we can accept the one-year proposal. We can accept a two-year extension. We can accept a three-year, three to five, they said. So I guess they're leaving that up to us. Um, so to answer some of Mary's questions, I've been on the ad hoc TV Internet Survey Committee, and it is, I think, the feeling of most of the people on the committee. I don't know. I can't speak for everyone, but certainly I know Carl and I feel that Rossmore residents are not, at this point, in a, in a position to uh, negotiate their own content across the board. That we, the, the feedback that we've heard from residents, the just looking at the sort of tech literacy of board members. Uh, I think that would be asking the, the residents uh, too much for the residents at this point. That's just sort of my gut feeling. I, other people may have other uh, feelings about that. And I don't think, so to be honest, I think my uh, thought was that if we uh, extended the Comcast contract another five years at the expiration of the existing contract, that that would probably be, bring us to the point where we would be ready to make those decisions. But that was just sort of my instinctual uh, thought about it. Um, Carl? Yes, I've been looking a lot into cord cutting. I'm subscribed to a number of letters. You know, yes, we could get, you know, buy a, you know, people could buy a Roku. And there are a lot of classic movie channels. And it's sort of like the old time. They're free, but you watch the ads. Uh, you know, but it's not the same as, as Turner Classic movies. I think what I'm seeing is the majority of cord cutters are in areas where they get over-the-air local news. I think there's a major opportunity for somebody to start selling, streaming, and local 
services on an interest level basis, but currently nobody's doing that. I can subscribe to Hulu, I can, you know, you know, there are, uh, uh, you know, there are a number of people, they're competitive to people paying standard rates. And unfortunately, it's an all or nothing package. No one has gone and established something that allows people to pick and choose. And I really think until somebody moves into that market segment, that cord cutting for somebody like us doesn't make any sense. What you really want is somebody can say, you know, I'm interested in sports, I'm interested in movies, I'm interested in drama things, I'm interested in just the major channels and things like that, and allowing you to pick and choose at least segments that you might be interested in. I don't see that happening, plus the fact that I think, you know, people are sort of used to the single remote and I think that a lot of people are going to have problems. I think renewing it five years is just too long. I would be willing to go with two or three years. The three year has a nice advantage of being able to include the 3% cap. But I think that, you know, it's like I don't want to be first, but I don't want to be much later than fifth. <laughs> Mary. So uh, my feeling is uh, we are we have a great contract now. It uh, will if we do nothing, it stops in 2021. At the end of 2021, we will have an opportunity then to negotiate maybe for more of the Comcast products. They have Flex. They have other things. Uh, their own market and their product lineup is changing. So we're giving up an opportunity to get things from Comcast um, that we might want. And I just can't imagine waiting until 2023. Uh, so I, I personally don't think we should extend the contract. And I can understand why they might want us to. Um, and I, I give our residents much more credit uh, in terms of technology. You know, this conversion to Comcast, they great support. We had during the conversion, and we have it now. So uh, my complaint is not with the service from Comcast, it's with losing an opportunity to negotiate for more products that they are developing now. Well, that's a point, but I, I wanna remind people what happened when they cut out the radio stations. We had Comcast willing to give residents for free um, Echo Dots that they would program for free to get the radio stations and people didn't want to take advantage of that because they wanted it in the, system, the format that they currently had. So I just think that we're ask. I think you're, you're asking a lot of people to assume that we're going to be ready to court cut. I agree that we might be negotiating for more products, but what would those be? It would be either telephone. Uh, we asked about the, uh, the item that was in the flex, flex, but, According to Comcast, we already have that opportunity, that available to us in our existing boxes. So that's not something we would need. Okay. So there's really, we would negotiate well. to have more um, uh, coverage maybe for Wi-Fi. We've read articles that say that once you read a certain, reach a certain speed level, that increases in speed isn't that great. So increasing the Wi-Fi coverage in common areas would be something we would negotiate. Um, possibly telephone, uh, but we've already uh, seen that, that some mutuals took it, and now we're trying to get out of that. Uh, so I'm not sure what could be there, but Kathleen? Okay, so um, you were talking about uh, taking the five-year extension, and um, because we were then guaranteed no more than a 3% uh, raise. No, I, actually, I was, I was talking about in discussions in our committee, before this all came up, we knew our contract expen expired in 2021, and some personal discussions in the committee, we were talking about what options would be at that point, whether it be time to look at cord cutting, and, and I'm just saying informally there was some feeling that it probably wasn't appropriate 
in two years' time to explore cord cutting, possibly in five years. It's not nothing official. It was just an informal discussion. Sure, sure. Uh, but anyway, so I, I think that um, doing the, the five-year extension um, for the for the idea of reducing it to 3% as a maximum increase um, probably isn't a good bet because um, they are having people leave in great numbers, and um, so they're not going to raise the starter package in the next couple of years a lot. I think that's a, a, you know, something that we can gamble on, that they're not going to be increasing it 4% every year. So I, I, I don't, don't think we I, need to I disagree. I mean, there are two... There are two approaches when you're in business. If you're losing customers, you have two approaches. You can raise your rates because you need to pay those costs, or you can start cutting services and all, but I don't know personally if I would bet that they're not going to raise their package rate because they have costs that are built in for these, this content. So I, I, I don't know if we can, I can't agree to that philosophy that they're not going to raise the rates. So, Mary? In the articles that I sent out, there were three of them. Uh, one of them, the, the headline was, Comcast and AT&T are losing more than 8,000 subscribers every day. In another article, there's a quote from the Comcast CEO, Brian Roberts. He said this on September 18th. Comcast has 55 million customers across its business, but the company lost cable TV customers for the past nine consecutive quarters. And it's not just Comcast, it's all of the companies in this business. I cannot believe that Comcast is going to raise the starter rate for the city of Walnut Creek, 4%, so that they can do that to us. And I have two data points. I have a friend in Danville whose Comcast uh, contract came up for renewal in July. She did not get any increase in her package. It was not the starter package. She did get increases in her equipment that she ramps. And I have a friend in Walnut Creek, same situation, not the starter package. So I don't know if they come out with the rates for the whole year in January, and then they apply them to their retail subscribers as uh, their contracts expire. But I think if they were to raise their rates 4% for the city of Walnut Creek, we'd get a lot more cord cutters and that market would develop faster. Dale? Bob, procedurally, <clears throat> I think we need to either do a straw vote on each of the packages or someone make a motion on a specific one. And if that's the case, I would make a motion that we leave well enough alone and stick with what we have. I guess my, the way I prefer to run the meetings is to try to hash out a bunch of the sort of understanding framing it first before we get into motions. I mean, we can discuss it after the motion's made, but I'd rather have a more informed dis motion since this is such a complicated topic. But well, you're, well, you're free to make a motion if you want, and if you no, get a no, second. No, that, that's okay. I, I, I just I don't want to upset the apple cart. So, <laughs> well, so, so, so I, I've already expressed that I think we should stick with what we have. Okay, Carl and then Kent. Yes, looking at, you know, I did a lot of study well in advance when we were doing the initial Comcast study. And right now I see televisions going, you know, the newer televisions, the ultra high definition, don't use the normal cable channels. It's all internet. If we look at the cost of internet, if we were to bring it in ourselves, the cost of the internet service would be less than $2 a manor, even if we add some management overhead. According to my rough estimates, I think we aren't ready for that kind of thing now, but we might be ready for that thing if we extend two to three years, I don't think we should extend the contract five years, but I do think uh, we probably, our outcome will be that, you know, we will want to extend it for at least a couple of years the way it is now. So I don't see any harm in going with the contract extension. I don't see any advantages. I think it'll put ourselves in a window I see opening up 
we will be better positioned at that point and the technology will have moved forward enough for us to make a good decision on a contract renewal and I'd rather see a, us looking at, at uh, a window that's moved on two to three years. I think it gives us a better advantage looking at the way technology is moving today. Ken? I'm kind of teetering between two positions. <clears throat> One, I recognize we have a great contract right now. And um, and if we can get um, if we can get or counter their three proposals with our own proposal to uh, to give us uh, the sports and entertainment package with only the cost to us of a two year extension and whatever increase they charge everybody outside of Rossmore that would be one proposal I think was would be a good one. But if we do that, we give up the bargaining position uh, for a new contract in a rapidly evolving uh, technology field. So I'm, te I'm teetering between those two points, countering or nothing. Dale and then Kathleen. I think we need to remember that if we do anything other than the current package, all residents are going to pay for TCM, whether they want it or not. Kathleen? Yeah, the whole discussion uh, we've had is um, it sounds like we are assuming that we're going to get TMC. So I think the first thing we need to decide is really uh, are we committed to doing one of these three options where we are getting the package with TMC? No, there's no com the first option is to do nothing. So we're not committing anything at this point. Okay, but there hasn't been any discussion along that Well, along I that guess lines. it's been assumed, but that is certainly an option. Less and then Mary. Uh, I was involved in the initial work on Comcast. And uh, just to let you know that what you're saying is that we're expecting everybody to pay for T. TCM, when we did this, we expected everybody to pay for Comcast, even those that didn't want it. So this is not an unusual move for us. Um, I see an advantage to extend our contract with Comcast, uh, as Carl says. Um, that gives time to look at what's changing within this industry and without having to go back and negotiate. Uh, and in, in uh, Ken's way, I, I don't see any reason to go back and try to renegotiate something. Uh, that always gives you an opportunity to lose something. So uh, I think we should, and I don't know where Bob is on this, whether we're ready to say something or not. A couple more comments and then we will. Mary. Uh, so, uh, Dale, I support your position. I don't think that we should accept any of these offers. And my question to all of you is, we know more content is going to move. You know, the new Hawaii Five-O moved out of Netflix somewhere else to pay TV. Uh, Netflix lost the ability to show the old reruns of Friends. Because, and so this, this is going to happen again. So what will we do when there's another channel that's the favorite of a thousand residents or a thousand manors? Uh, I, I think that this is a precedent we ought to think about as well. And I am opposed to, to um, having all of the residents pay for a channel that only a few people watch, <clears throat> 15%. Well, I, I, I would like to make a comment about that. Um, we, <coughs> the nature of GRF is that a few people participate in a lot of things that everyone pays for. Right. If you look at lawn bowling, <coughs> we pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to maintain those lawn bowling courses, uh, but only a few people lawn bowl. Tennis is probably the same thing. Um, how many manners really ride the bus? I, I think that is a... If we start looking at numbers of people, we're going to, that's the precedent that I'm concerned about because then that gives justification for ending a lot of things that 
we do hear that not many people use. And it seems to me that, that if we start down that path, uh, where's, where do we end it then? Uh, the other thing is, I guess just I'm thinking about gambling, and it is a gamble. We don't know what they're going to increase the rates, if they are going to increase them at all. I'm just wondering how I'm going to feel if I vote to not accept this, and then on January 1st, they raise our rates 2% or 4% anyway, and we've gotten nothing for it. So that's, that's a consideration. But my main argument, I guess, is that it's hard for, for us to, to try to make decisions based on the number of people that use it. At some point, obviously, you have to. If nobody's doing something, you have to cut that service. But it, that's, the, to me, a, a dangerous way to proceed. Kathleen? Um, well, I will just say, and I'm not saying I um, <coughs> don't, you know, think we shouldn't have the TMC, but I will just say that um, the lawn bowling and the bus service and some of these other things are in the trust agreement, right? TMC is not. Barbara, did you have? No? Okay. Carl, and then Les. Yes, it's my understanding that we went from the starter package to the preferred, uh, to the current package we have now because of TMC. So we already made that decision once. Maybe if, I think if we make the decision not to extend the contract and not to pay for TMC, that we in our new negotiations have to consider maybe going back to the basic or not provide, just providing internet. Dale? Equating TCM to all of the other amenities in Walnut Creek is fallacious. People move here because of a lot of those other amenities. My guess is no one moves here because they can get TCM. The people, it's important to the people who live here, but I would doubt, and Sue would know because she has people coming here, there probably hasn't been a single person who says, I'm willing to buy a condo here if I can get TCM. No, but Hallmark did. I heard Hallmark, Hallmark, so, you know, it's... Les? Uh, can't, Excuse Kathleen. me, please please stop making comments from the audience. Kathleen, the lawn bowling is out of the coupon, not out of the trust. It's an operational fund. So all of those are operational, the golfing, the lawn bowling, all, all of those. Trust. She meant that it was mentioned in the trust. It was mentioned in the trust, but the operation right. of them is from the coupon. But I, let's, let's stop talking about TCM. Let's look at the opportunity in two of these things to increase the contract for two years, and if we take option three, increase it in three years and reduce the maximum payment of 4% to 3%. Uh, TCM just happens to be the thing that brought this around. I think our benefit is to increase the contract. And the fact that the $2.20 is very possibly could be the increase in our Comcast if we do nothing. So I think we're getting a lot for the, these proposals. It does not matter about TCM to me. It's the increase in the years of the contract. Well, it's certainly possible we could increase the contract without adding the TCM package, General. Carl? Yes, I, I think that I kind of agree with Les. I think looking at the technology and looking the way things move and looking at our population, I really think we will be in a much better position to do to negotiate a an extension of the contract in two to three years. I wouldn't want to go beyond three years, but looking at where the industry is moving, I think we're going to be in a much better position to make that decision. And I, I agree with Les. I think that uh, an increase, and from what I hear, I hear people are, are really interested in TCM, people opposed to it, 
but I think universally most people are very happy with what we have now. And, mo and I've gotten close to 100% approval that, you know, we should, in our negotiations, we should uh, uh, continue with what we have now with Comcast. My fear is I don't want to negotiate another five-year contract today uh, based on where things are because I expect that in a few years, less than five, uh, we will be seeing changes in the industry, and I think that would be a much better timing to do our new contract negotiations. Barbara and then Sue. I agree with Carl. I think um, 2023, um, the, pop, the residents may have moved to a point where they would go with some options. And so I, I like it to go out to about 2023. Sue, and then I guess I'm going to ask for some motion. I just want to know, are we deciding on one of the three decisions? I mean, we're talking and talking and talking and agreeing and whatever, but I want to know, are we making the decision? Are we going to take one, two, or three, or nothing? Is that what we're that's trying the, to do? That's the decision, right. So okay. I'm going to ask for motions now to see if we can get support for any particular motion. Wait, Tim. Just before you make the motion, I, I just wanted to ask if you wanted to have a resident forum on this before you do the motion. Yeah, no one had submitted a form, but we can do that. I believe there was someone who filled out a form but did not give it to me. Was there anyone wanting to speak during this portion as a resident forum? Okay, if you'd like to speak, could just go up to the microphone, give your name and address, and you have three minutes. I think that we should keep things just as they are, and including TCM. And uh, if people want a sport package, that's up to them. It is ridiculous to put TCM in with sports. We have sports on regular TV all the time. You turn on Channel 7 and it's, it's NFL football. You turn on Channel 5, it's it's same thing. And those are all commercial. This is, at least TCM is one that is totally known commercial. And it, it's a relief to be able to watch TV without commercials because Believe me, they drive you nuts. And so, but, but the thing is that TCM does offer a good selection of old movies and all, and it's great help. My husband is disabled, and I know a lot of other people are disabled, and he can't go anywhere or do much, and he watches TCM almost exclusively. And um, it's... Uh, Netflix is okay, but uh, that's that's separate, and we pay separately for that anyway. So I just want to beg of you to leave TCM as uh, in our contract, and if it costs two dollars and twenty cents, big deal. I mean, I I don't use the golf course, so I'm paying for that. I don't use the pools, and I'm paying for that. So. I just want to have TCM remain as our option in our contract the way it stands. Unfortunately, so ma'am, we can't. Of you to keep TCM on. That's not and an op that's not an option. They T Comcast is moving it. We have no option to leave it as it is. So, so we have to if we're going to keep TCM, you can either pay your 9.95 a month or we the board will vote for one of these options. So Well, but the TCM is not included in any of those options? It is, yes. It is Yes, if, we, if the board decides to accept one of the proposals from Comcast, we would pay two twenty a month extra every home. That's fine. And get them. Okay, well, that's good. That's, we, yeah. We've heard what you had to say, but we yeah. can't leave it as it is. Yeah, we want to leave it as it is. You okay, <laughs> thank you. Point of information. Uh, my name is Vicki Jennings, and I've... 
another woman and I were uh, forming a committee to protest getting rid of TCM, and there was quite a number of us. We were going to have our own meeting and everything. Then we saw in the news that there may be a possibility that, that we'll still have TCM. So we thought, okay, we'll wait and see what they do. And so um, we're all hoping that we will get TCM back, uh, stay, keep it stay. Uh, Thank you. In our contract. Yeah, I think it's become uh, confused is vague as to whether when we talk about three and five year extensions, are we talking in addition to the two years remaining on our contract? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I'll entertain motions at this point. Oh, Les? I move that we accept option three uh, and with a three year extension on the contract. Okay, discussion of that. So, Carl? Yes, we're not sure whether, whether we need the, uh, um, whether Comcast will reach that cap on of 4%, whether the 1% will help us. However, I think a two to three year extension is, beneficial aside from the TCM issue. But however, the 220 implies a 4%. My understanding is, is if we do the extension, it's the less of the two, it's not necessarily a $2.20% increase. Is that correct? No, it's $2.20 for sure. So it'll be for the, the full whatever 4%. the contract is. So Just be, let me let me explain. It'll be two dollars and twenty cents added to our base contract going forward. Two thousand twenty, there will be no additional increase. <laughs> two thousand twenty one and the other years of the contract, if we extend it, would be based on the original contract of up to four percent maximum based on what the increase is in the outside world. But we get two twenty for sure in twenty twenty. So if it goes up, so if if we decide not to do anything, we may only have a dollar ten increase or something like that. If they increase it at all, so it's right. more than the extension; it's waiving the minimum of the outside uh, increase. It's accepting the full four percent right. for the next year, plus the extension. Well. In future years, then we'll be back to the co the uh, the contractual amount okay. unless we accept this version, which it's limited to three instead of four. Dale and then Ken. Do, is my understanding correct that if we extend the contract three years, that we're actually talking about it being five years from now? Yes. yes. So for five years, yeah. and that's a concern that I have way out into the future, that far into the future, with all of the changes that are taking place? That is the question. Ken. I would like to amend uh, Les's motion to delete the $2.20 automatic increase and change it to increase the rate according to the outside increase for a basic service outside of Rossmore. That's such a total increase. That's a, that's a different a totally different beast. It seems to me you're asking us to counter then, which is you've been proposing, that we, we go back to Comcast with something not, not on their proposed list, correct? Yes. <clears throat> okay, I, it seems to me that's so different from the proposal here. I, I, I mean, you can make a proposal later on if this one fails to do that, but I, I just don't see that. I mean, that's dramatically changing the motion. It's not just amending it. No, I think there's a question about that. I think that. that's parliamentary correct, Deborah. I don't think I don't think that he has to accept it. That was clarified earlier. So, you're right. He doesn't have to accept it. But I'm saying that I don't think that it's appropriate. I mean, we can get to see if you get a second on it. But it has to be seconded. If it's not seconded, it's correct. Right. Okay. I, I just think that it's inappropriate. But go ahead and propose it. And if, is there a second to Ken's motion amendment? Okay. Other, other discussion of, of his proposal. Mary? 
I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating. Are you, well, I don't support extending the contract we have today for five years. I think it puts us at a disadvantage. And uh, so. Any other discussion of the motion? Carl. I, I thought we, it'll, though it'll be five years from now, I thought that the motion was only to extend it for three years. Plus the two years. From the ex end of our existing yeah, plus contract. Plus the, uh, to extend it three years, and not, 24. it would be five years from now. No. Kathleen. So if we just go ahead and vote on this, then we can move on to um, someone else making another different motion. No, if we vote on this and if it fails, then we can move on. Right, if exactly. it passes, Sorry. then yes. that's it. Okay, so ready to vote. All in favor of Les's motion, raise your hand. Okay, motion fails. All opposed? Okay, is there any other motion? Mary. I move that we continue with the Comcast contract that we have today, and then we don't accept any of these three offers from Comcast. I guess I'd just like to mention that if that's the case, then it seems to me it would be advantageous to use Ken's lo logic here and, and instead go back to them with a the counter. I mean, if we're not going to do anything anyway, if that's your motion, are you opposed to? She's opposed to I'm motion. opposed to changing the contract that we have today. Okay. We have a second discussion of this. I know, that's what I'm saying we do. Ken? Yeah, uh, if we pass this motion, we may result in what Bob pointed out earlier, that we may get nothing. And we, whereas the alternative may be getting the SE uh, Sports and Entertainment Package for free with just the two-year extension. Wouldn't be for free. Well, it'd be, it's a gamble of whether they're gonna raise the rates or not. We don't know. Kathleen? Uh, so I just to, to clarify, Mary, does this mean that we would not be getting TM, uh, TMC? This? this means that Comcast would proceed and put Turner Classic Movies into the set package, and those residents that want that will have to pay nine ninety five a month to Comcast. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay, all in favor of Mary's motion, uh, say aye, or raise your hand. Let's make it easier for Deborah. Opposed? Okay, it failed too, so we're a bit of a conundrum. I guess we need another motion, somebody. Uh, <laughs> okay, Carl? Yes, I propose we do, we, we do the two-year contract because I think that will put us in a better position. I don't like, I kind of agree that we're moving far out and I don't see much advantage of the difference between the, the two and the 4%. But as I've mentioned before, I think we would be in a better bargaining position for a contract to start bargaining two years from now on something that will will be in uh, four years, that will affect us four years. I think we're gonna start seeing changes in two to three years. And I think uh, a new contract that would take effect in four years would put us in a much better position considering what technology is doing today and it'll help okay, residents. Okay, let, let's get the motion and then, uh, yeah. So the motion is that we accept their proposal for $2.20 uh, per manor for 2020 and extend the contract two years. The increase of 220 would be the total increase for 2020, $2.20 for 2020. And then for the following years of the contract, we'd be back to the contract with a maximum of 4%. So that's the motion, right? Yes. Is there a second? I'll second, and I would like to comment. Okay, so we have a second. Now, let's comment. Uh, I agree with you, Carl. Except uh, I think if you take the option that I had originally presented, uh, you would reduce the cap to 3% instead of 4%. Uh, I don't understand why one more year on the contract wouldn't uh, be worth a change of 1%. 
but we did vote that down. So, Dale. Well, since the proposal, since the proposal that I preferred is dead, uh, I will be voting on this one, and I will be voting in favor of this one. Sue. I want to get really clear. If we do this proposal, we are extending uh, for two more years after that at the current 4%. Yes. What's happening is if we vote for this motion, the cost of Comcast will go to 5720, which is already in the budget, which is what we approved in the budget for uh -huh. 2020. That's the cost. 2021 and 2022 and 2023 will have a base of 5720 and possible. possible of increase up to 4% based on what happens in the outside world. Got it. And if they give us timely notes. Okay, other discussion about this motion? Carl and then Ken. Yeah, it's also my understanding to clarify things that this does not affect the contracts that the mutuals have with Comcast. That's right. They've, Comcast has said that their uh, separate agreements on phone and other things will expire at the normal 2021 period and they can negotiate at that point. Ken? Yeah, this, this proposal would automatically give Comcast a 4% increase and they're losing 8,000 customers every day. And so I don't think they're going to be raising their, their rates uh, 4%. Um, so that's why I would be against this proposal. Well, there's no clarification. I mean, again, I think it's a business decision on Comcast. They're going to be sitting there and saying, how many of those people can actually switch to streaming? Because many people in the country don't have enough bandwidth to switch to streaming. So there could make a decision, it seems to me, to raise the rates, I mean, to keep the rates, uh, equal their in revenue by raising the rates to the people who can't switch. But we have no way of knowing. It's a gamble. So Kathleen... Um, uh, no one has made a motion about doing any, any counter proposal to them. And so um, I'm, I'm sort of don't know how to vote on this one unless uh, if I vote this one down, then I would be uh, interested in a, a counter proposal to them, which I would consider. So um, can someone clarify before we vote on this one what a counter proposal might be uh, to them? And you guys over there were talking about that. Well, you could you could maybe possibly make an amended amendment to this um, this motion. Just a thought that would amend it to say our first approach would be to make a counter. Now, if Comcast is watching this, then I guess that would sort of <laughs> be sort of pointless. But you could do that. Um, that's true. If we vote for this, then then and the people accept it, then it's down. If we vote it down, then you can make a proposal for a counter offer. Okay, then I would um, like to make an amendment that uh, our, our first option uh, would be to make a counter proposal, uh, or or I would like to hear you know what they have. But my amendment would be that we do a counter proposal first. And what is the counter proposal? Well, that's what I'm saying. Is I wanted to hear what what people are t talking about as a possible, or maybe Tim can. You know what? What would we counter propose? Okay, so you you want to propose an amendment to the mo pro the motion, but you don't know exactly what it is. So if if yes. there's a second to that, we can discuss it. If not, then we won't. Is there a second to Kathleen's I'll point of order, Mr. President? <laughs> I I I think the only way to do what Kathleen wants is to vote this one down first and then offer a counter proposal. Well, that's sort of what I was trying to tell you last time when you wanted to amend <laughs> Les's motion, but... I learned. <laughs> okay, so I... Uh, Carl and then Dale. Yes, I, I, I guess I'm sort of concerned about the, this thing from a procedural point because if we don't come to any majority decision, essentially it's no decision, can we bring up an initial mo motion again if we decide we don't like any of, of the other counter proposals. Yes, you can. I'm wondering if it might not be appropriate to move this discussion at this point to the executive session since we are talking about a contract issue. Tim, what do you think about that? 
Uh, it would be appropriate. Um, the optics are a little different, obviously, if you're making a decision behind closed doors after having this lengthy deliberation. Residents who are watching this or listening to this might feel that it's not as transparent as it should be. But contract negotiations are a reason to move to executive session. Dale? I have a question for Tim. Tim, if, we've, if we vote on the current motion, those of us who already have the package, the sports and entertainment, and are paying the extra now, if we adopt this new one, would that mean that we would no longer, like I would no longer pay exactly. what I'm paying now, I would pay the 220 or whatever it turns Correct. out to be? Your nine, the 995 would go away. Okay. I'm all in favor of this. <laughs> <laughs> Dale is recusing himself. <laughs> Barbara? I just want to make clear that if we go with this motion, the 4%, um, it, they're not for sure going to raise our rates by 4%. If we go with this motion, they won't raise the rates in 2020. Right. But after that, it's, it's not the, necessarily true that they will raise it. No, it'll be back to if they raise it on the outside. Right. Otherwise, it'll will. say 5720 Right, for exactly. Each year. So. Just so you know, it's not automatically 4% every year. Right. Correct. Any other discussion? Carl. Yes. Uh, one is... The 15 percent we're talking about TCM, we have not included the potential, as you mentioned, we're not considering the benefit that from people who are subscribing to the sports channels. And the other thing is, if they haven't raised the base rate in a number of years with the increase and the cost of content, which I expect is increasing, and Turner is probably a good example of that. Uh, I'm thinking that it's likely that it may be a significant increase in base rates since they haven't been increasing them over the years. For information. Ken? Um, there's a motion on the floor, and in order to move it to executive session, we have to vote against this motion on the floor. Is that correct? I don't know, but it sounds like we're not going to do that anyway because we don't want to... I'm sorry. The opti it sounds like we're not going to do that anyway. It was just a question I had. So, so uh, we're not pursuing that. Not. Well, we're, we're discussing. But we could if we voted against this motion. Uh, yes. Okay, any other discussion of this? Okay, all in favor of the motion, raise your hands. <laughs> no. No, no, you didn't get a second for the amendment. Yes, you did. Oh, you seconded it? Yeah, yeah. We didn't hear that. We, none, of, I didn't, none of us heard that. I heard it. I heard it, too. Okay. I seconded it. Okay, we have to back up. Sorry. Otherwise, you guys should have yelled at me because we needed to discuss that amendment then. Okay, so... I was confused, but, but there I did was second. no amendment. Yes, there was. <laughs> Kathleen made an amendment that we... I didn't understand the amendment. Okay. Okay, so she proposed that we amend the motion to include a counteroffer first to Comcast that they, and then we were gonna discuss. She didn't actually propose what would be included in that counteroffer, just that there would be a counteroffer to Comcast. Wait, so we had a second, so now we're gonna discuss it. Okay, Les. I, I'm at a loss for what a counter offer would be. That's what we're discussing right now. I, I'm still at a loss for what a counter <laughs> offer would be. Okay. It makes uh, it makes very little sense to me to say let's do a counter offer without knowing what it is. Well, secondly, that's, that's what we're deciding. Secondly, uh, I know Tim has a, a lot to say about a possible counter offer. Uh, so tell me what you think a counteroffer would be, please. Well, let, I think the board should decide what the counteroffer would be. Can, Tim, if you have some procedural information. So I would suggest that it would be 
it's completely counterproductive to discussing a counter offer in a public setting where Comcast, who we would be negotiating against, is privy to this information. They would be viewing this videotape, likely. So I would suggest if you want to go the route of a counter offer, that you recess into executive session. Um, I can tell you, having worked with this now for several weeks with the Comcast people to get it to the proposal that you have in front of you, I don't believe there will be any countering to this. We can counter, and all they can do is say no, but uh, they winnowed this rate down and down several times to get it to the, what you have in front of you. I, I don't believe that there's much, they say they're giving it to us at their cost. So I, I don't know that they would absorb anything more than that. So, but if you want to go down this route with a counter offer, I don't think having this discussion in public would be appropriate because they would be hearing the deliberation and would know what you've already willing to settle on or not. Um, that's counterproductive to a counter offer. So I guess the, the process then is to vote on the amendment. If the amendment is approved, then we would continue further discussion in executive session. If the menu, f if the motion amended, amendment to the motion fails, then we would continue to vote on this motion in public. So any other discussion about the amendment? Go ahead, Barbara. So at this point, it's a general amendment to discuss potential counter offers with no specifics. Go ahead. So if I vote yes, then that means we're going to consider counter offers. In executive session, correct. And so so this most so this option two um, that has to include that? Um, if the if the amendment passes, we're gonna stop discussion of this until the executive session. Okay. Ken and then Carl. Yeah, I, th I think we should vote against the uh, amendment and the main motion and move it to executive session. Carl? Yes, I, I, I'm i not really crazy about executive session, and I kind of get the feeling from Tim, and I tend to believe him, is I think Comcast will not go any lower or provide us a better offer than it's offering now. Okay, so Dale. I'm totally opposed to moving into executive session. If this item were gonna be an executive session to begin with, it should not have been up here and publicly uh, worked on today. It should have started out in executive session. Mary. Uh, Tim, could you clarify if we were to uh, go to executive session to work on some sort of a counter offer? Is there a deadline that we have to have the counter offer into? Um, no, the on only deadline is that it's hard and fast that October 10th the channel is moving away. So, if, to do this seamlessly, yeah. so that people don't lose the ability to watch TCM. We, this is really it right now. It's tomorrow is when I had to get notice to them. Yeah, I needed to give them notice by, by tomorrow. That could have probably been fudged into Monday if we needed to. Okay. So if we counter, it's going to likely delay, which means there will be an interruption in TCM if we were, were to arrive at an agreement at a later date. Okay, are we ready to vote on the amendment? So if this happens, then if we vote, if it passes the amendment, then we will cease discussion of this topic and take it up in executive session. So all in favor of the amendment, raise your hand. Not even the person who made the amendment? <laughs> who's, who's vice president here? I think I, I'm... <laughs> Okay, we're back to the unamended motion to accept the proposal of $2.20 for the year 2020 uh, and for the years after that, extending the contract two more years 
going back to the contract for the determination whether there'll be any other increases with a maximum of 4%. Why don't you let her read the proposal to us? It's item two, isn't it? It's number two. It's number two. Okay. Okay. Any last discussion before we vote? All in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Okay, all opposed. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so what we have done is we have voted to increase the cost based on their proposal of $2.20 for 2020. It will include the sports package and TCM and that's it. So. Okay, um, announcements. The next mid-month regular meeting of the board will be held Tuesday, October 8th at 9 a.m. here in Peacock Hall. We will be discussing the uh, emergency plan um, uh, created by Lopez and Associates. That will be the only topic on the, probably the only topic on the agenda. The next end of the month regular meeting of the board will be held on Thursday, October 31st here at 9 a.m. in Peacock Hall, and we are recessing to an executive session. 